All righty, how y'all are today? It's Boudreaux in Eunice, as always. Boudreaux. All right, there's my other channel hat on there, Cajun Coin Hunter. All right, we got, as always, we got Mater in here, Mater's Workshop. And there he is. And I think you've got your YouTube side on, Mater. Yeah, that one, I got that one turned off. Yeah, I saw you reach for something. Yeah, well, I had to get my cigarette. Okay. <laughs> Big dog leather, what's happening, my brother? I haven't seen you in uh -oh. a little while. All right, who let the dogs out? Yeah, roof, roof, who let the dogs out? I've been knowing Big Dog Leather for quite some time on this this channel, my boo channel. Andrew O'Neill, what's going on? Black Cloud Mining. He's over there in Kingston, oh, Arizona. Andrew. He's he's north of Kingston, up in the gold basin up there. Oh. He's oh, a uh, miner. Arizona? Kingston, yeah. Oh. Way up in the corner. Up Way up there by uh, Laughlin. In that area up there, Kingston, Bowhead City. Right. I've been through Kingston before. All right. They got uh, Route 66. Get your kids on Route 66. 66. That's right. Yep. I've been knowing Big, big Dog. Uh, I don't know. How long have we been knowing each other, Big Dog? What? Eight yep. years? Something like that? Seven, eight years? Yeah. King, Kingman, Arizona. That's not far from uh, Davis Moffin. And that, yeah, that's that's where that uh, Air Force uh, reclamation base at. I want to go out there. Which one you said, Mathis? Davis Mawson. Oh. It's, uh, I, know there's, I think Mathis or whatever is in Tucson. Well, you got Davis Mawson, which is, of course, a, the Air Force base, or uh, but you've got Pima Air Museum. And that was, you know, like, um, that's in Pima was, County. That's in well, Pima I County. Don't know if it's Pima County, but I know it's, uh, Davis, you know, Pima. And the reason I said I'd like to go out there is because after World War II, once it was all over, you know, so they had to bring all the, um, airplanes back that we had over in Europe and uh, over in the Pacific. So they would take all the planes to different bases throughout the world or throughout the United States. I mean, there was one here in Texas. You had uh, Altus, Oklahoma. and But the big one was uh, Davis Malta out there in uh, Pima. And, yeah, a lot of those planes were taken out there. And there's videos from back in, uh, I think, 46, 47. And they were literally taking a piece of metal is probably 30 feet in width and probably two, three feet in thickness. And it was like a big old wedge had the point and everything on the bottom. They were literally picking that whole thing up and dropping it, cutting the planes in pieces. Okay. Davis Mountain is in Tucson, Arizona. That's what I thought. Well, it's like, it's, yeah. That's, Kingman, it's way, that's way south uh, east of Kingman. That's in yeah. Pima County. Okay. Two sides well, of the, uh, right. Yeah. Well, they had they had some, they had some planes over there in Kingman also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, just about every town up in Arizona is going to have planes because of the fact that it's that dry, arid air. Right. In fact, right. they sent a bunch of uh, the uh, C 130s. Right. A bunch right. of C 130s and a bunch of fighter jets. Guess where they brought them to? Guess what he transferred them to? I mean, all operating planes. Probably out to uh, either Kingman or they could send them to uh, Davis Mawson, which is no, the main. No, 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 no. From, from, from Tucson, they sent, I don't know, like two or three hundred working aircraft. Guess what he shipped them to for storage? Don't tell me. Louisiana, right there wow. by Hawton, but in between Bossier City 
and Houghton, Louisiana, at uh, that Air Force Base, uh, Barksville Air Force Base. With all that okay. humidity and all that, I mean, it's not quite as humid as down here on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, you know, but man. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you know, what? I, I don't know. Somebody told me that that they ship. Oh, you from Louisiana? Yeah, but well, that's where they shipped a bunch of our planes to over there. I'm like, where? And uh, yeah, I had yeah. forgot yeah. about that Air Force Base, you know, because I'm South Louisiana, not up north, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, 80 miles from the Arkansas border, you know. Right. right. And I'm like, man, I can't imagine them. Moving in planes there with it. Well, it, it, all in planes are aluminum anyway, you know? Yeah. Well, like I said, yeah, oh, yeah. It was over. they sent all those planes. They brought them back, you know, to different Air Force bases throughout the United States. I know there was, uh, uh, I believe there was even one up in uh, New York somewhere. They had, uh, of course, I think Washington. Uh, like I said they had them here in Texas. Uh, I know Alta, Oklahoma, and of course out in uh, FEMA, you know, Davis Mothin, that, that's the main one right now. Um, but that's yeah, where. It's Pima County, yeah. Uh, Davis Mothin, that's. Uh, uh, right there in Tucson. I'm trying to type something and talk. Yeah, I guess I can't yeah. chew gum and walk at the same time, huh? Well, Andrew's saying he's in Utah, Yucca, Arizona. Yeah, you say the one you actually want to see, uh, yep. you know, which is a big one, uh, museum, uh, is in uh, Yucca, Arizona. Yeah, okay, Yucca, okay. Well, I know that um, we've got the, uh, I'm not going to be politically correct on it, okay? But to me, it's the uh, Confederate Air Force. They used to be out. They started off originally down in Harlingen. Then they moved out to Midland, Odessa area. Now they're up here in Dallas. And they've actually got the largest collection of not only World War II, but post-World War II military aircraft. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and well, right I, in, in between Longview and Dallas, I want to say it's in between Longview and Dallas. They have a museum there. Uh, it's the, uh, you remember the gliders during World War II? Yep. Yeah. The gliders that was being, were being pulled for D-Day and all that? Yep. They have a, a museum up there in between Longview and Johnny's been over there. Johnny Bess has been there. Oh really? And he and he's the one who told me about it. Yeah, him and his dad stopped there. They were doing. They were at. Uh, they were at a. It was either a shot show. That's what we call it in the gun trade. A shot show, right. or right. it was for uh, the. What they did, they they flew from Dallas to Vegas. I think it was. No, no, they were in Dallas, Fort Worth area. And it was for a Mercury or a Johnson show, a, a, a boat show, a right. boat show. Right. And they were either the Mercury dealer at the time or the Johnson and Evinrude dealer. They okay. were one of the dealers at the time, and they drove there from here in Eunice up there. And on the way back, his dad wanted to stop at the museum. And Johnny didn't even know about it. So if that's sort of where I'm at. If you find out that information, I'd like to find out about it too. Yeah. Uh, just just look life? up uh, uh, World War II Glider Museum, Dallas, Texas. Just put Dallas. It's going to give you the town in between Longview and Dallas. All right. Okay. How you been, Andrew? I know it's a little hot to be mining for gold over there or prospecting for gold, but hey, you know, if you're on the water doing it, 
you're going to be on a creek bank somewhere, a river bed, river bank. You're going to have water around you to do it. So you can cool yourself off in that part of Arizona. I do <laughs> And it shows me Lubbock. Lubbock? Yep, outside of Lubbock. No, that's, that's, not way, Lubbock. that's on the other side. No, Lubbock is up in the panhandle. Oh, yeah. But no, this, unless this they moved is... from Idaho up to Tech, up to Lubbock. Let me, uh, let me look it up. Well, I, I, I found the one and it says it's silent wings and everything. So that's what I'm, that's what I've got looked up. They might have moved it. I have no idea. Solid Wings is Solid Wings Museum. Yep. Uh, pilots. Uh, let me see. Wikipedia. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, I guess they moved it. Unless. I'm going to have to ask Johnny again because we looked it up and he said it was in between Longview and Dallas and I looked it up. It might be in Lubbock. It's going to be the other guy because even on this note it says I believe, but it says it's in Lubbock County. Okay. Yeah, Lubbock, Texas. Yep. They might have a different one. There might be a different one. That has a glider between Longview and Dallas. They might have another museum. There but, might be. Uh, Johnny did recognize that silent wing. Silent wings, he did. So that that might be the area. Okay. Well, they might, like I said, they might have. How long ago was it that they uh, went there? Oh God, this when Mr. Frank was still living. Yeah, we're talking about uh, oh, 20, 25 years ago, probably. Okay, they probably could have moved since then. I'll holler at him tomorrow. I didn't talk to him today. I'll give him a shout tomorrow. I don't know. He's probably still up. Yeah, I know he's still up right now. But sometimes he falls asleep in his chair watching TV. <laughs> and then usually about this time or 11 o'clock is that is uh, Aaron will call him, one of his buddies. I'll call him at 11, 11 30. He was like, Aaron, why do you call me every night at 11 30? I told you, I might be sleeping. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, all right. I just found it. Okay. This is the first Silent Wings Museum open to the public in Carroll. Now, that is in between, you know, that's just a little bit east of me. So, yeah, Terrell's probably. Uh, maybe at the most hour away from me. So okay, that would be in between um, long view in here. Long view in the right. Okay. Yeah. It says, is it, uh, is it, north, is it okay. north to the interstate? Uh, I, Terrell's right off of, I think, 20. Yeah. So 20 north. Is you take out the uh, long view. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 20 runs. It, right through dead in the middle of Longview yep. and then yep. kind of like the south side of Dallas uh, or you take that, that 
interstate going around Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, but, so they said they needed. Um, uh, it says Terrell site was closed in January 2001. All right. And they, well, that's they the, relocated to Lubbock. Okay, that's the place then, right there. Yep. So yeah, that that would be the same one. But like I said, they relocated up to Lubbock in 2000. Right. So that'd be 20 years ago. So if it was, you know, over 20 years ago, then yeah, he would have seen it yeah, there in the That was it because they wasn't going to, his dad would not have drove from Dallas to Lubbock. No. Right. That's, that's a good distance right there. That That's a road trip. Yep. Yeah, because for me... Um, Terrell says it's 49 minutes away, so it's less than an hour. Yeah, how far is Lubbock from you? About uh, five? <laughs> um, it, that's a good drive right there. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it says Terrell's like 40 miles away from me, and it is right off of, uh, it's actually off of Highway 80. So, I mean, it's right there. If so, anywhere in between 20 and 80, yeah. Right. That was, now, that how, was, but, but how far of a drive is it for you to Lubbock? For you to drive to Lubbock? To Lubbock? Oh, uh, hang on. I can tell you right now. I want to say about five. If no, not a I know I'm kind of in the zone. No, not uh, Andrew. I did not get a notification for it. Uh, what you yeah. got? A, a prospecting video or Morgan dollars or what? Uh, okay. If I was to go by car, it's about five and a half hours. All right. Well, I was I was in the zone. I said about five hours. Yep. Yeah. Or a little more. You know, yeah. six, five to six. Yeah, 368 miles. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. You, uh, you can do like 400. You round it off to 400 divided by 70. Uh, you know, so uh, seven times. Wait, how, how many miles? Yeah, 400. Okay. Yeah. So six times five, 30. So, yeah, if you average in 65 miles an hour, yeah. But, but you know, on the other state, it's uh, a little bit more. The speed limit's 70 or 75 in that area. Yeah, most of the time it's 75. Now, believe it or not, I can get down from where I'm at, I can get down to Galveston in under four hours. Galveston? Yeah, I get to Galveston yeah. in less than four hours. Yeah, you jump on uh, 45 and head straight south. Yep, because I'm right here off of 45 as it is. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, right. I don't even, I'm probably a mile away from my 45. So, yeah, I can hit I-45 and I can hook them on south. And I know I'd have right. to make, now, I know in November when I go down to the Lone Star uh, Rally, um, I'll be going on the, the bike and everything. So I do know that I'll fill up here and then probably uh, down by Madisonville I'll, or somewhere down that area, I'll stop again and top the bike off. And that'll get me right into Houston. All right. That'll actually get me into Galveston. Yeah, the only problem was on the bike and everything, I don't get, I, I don't have as big a fuel tank on my, my tri-glide as a car, so I can only go so far with it, but hey, that's the luxury of riding on a motorcycle. Ooh, Prescott, yeah. 
I've heard of that little town. Used up pay dirt? Huh. Used up pay dirt, yeah. Uh he went through he went through it again. Uh, oh, yeah. with the uh panning. Panning for gold. Right. right. Most people when they panning for gold, like with pay dirt, okay. What you do, you take a sluice box out there. Uh, or some kind of sluice, whatever, a uh, dry bank, wet bank, whatever, when you prospecting for gold. And when you do your mats, you empty your mats and all that. Right. right. You know, or, or whatever, you know, you got gold in your mats on a sluice box. And then you got some at the, the, the catch, the bar catch down there, which Hey, Miss Crystal, you'll have, uh, or you can do your cons, your concentrates. That's okay. your paper, yeah. your concentrates. When you pan it. Uh, water, please. Yeah. Yeah. When you panning, panning pay dirt, like if you buy it on Amazon or eBay. Right. Uh, right. Uh, the pay dirt seeded, so you're guaranteed a certain amount of gold, and okay. all it is yeah. is to have fun with it for beginners right. to right. learn. Okay, and the pay dirt, the guys that's selling it have no idea what's in it. They could have some quartz or gem or whatever, but sometimes it's just regular yard dirt, and they seed it with gold. And okay. one time, uh, EVG Hobbies. He was doing uh, some pay dirt and they had some little bracelet, bracelet now, gold in there. This guy oh, chopped bro. up in a grinder or something. He chopped up a bunch of gold in, from necklaces, bracelets, the, the little mini chains. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, man, that's wrong right there. <laughs> you know, that. No, that that's no fun to pan. You know, you want flake gold. You want little small nuggets, stuff like that. And uh, EBG uh, Hobbies, he sells his pay dirt. He's in uh, he's in Florida now, but his claim is up there in over there in uh uh. Let me see. Crap, I forgot. Andrew, where's EVG's claim at? I don't think it's in Montana. I think it's in Colorado. Colorado is where his claim is at. And he takes a, a pump, a dredge, and his uh, sluice box up there. How much <laughs> is out there in the streams and everything? A lot. People Is still finding it. People still finding it. You're not gonna find no big nuggets like on uh Pale Rider, you know, that Clint Eastwood moving. Yep. You know, this guy find he they they move a huge boulder and they find a gold nugget this big. No, you ain't gonna find nothing like that. In Australia you're gonna find some uh some big nuggets, you know. But you gotta have the know how in the outback. To go back in there and survive off of the land. You're not just yep. going to take yep. 10 cans of potted meat and a couple of loaves of bread and live out there for two or three months. You better know how to survive off the land and know how to find water. Yep. yep. That's true. That's true. Hey, on your end. On my end? Yeah, because I, you know, I don't hear it when you talk, but I hear it on when it comes through on uh, when I'm talking. You know how you say when uh, uh, 
I've got my phone and we're talking. I got you hooked up to that speaker. Okay, how about now? Let's try this. Okay. See if it works. I, well, I don't hear any echo when I'm talking. Okay. Yeah, you see that speaker that you have? Uh, I, I guess my mic is sensitive. Okay. Yeah, Crystal was saying that when I was talking, uh, saying that it uh, sounded like a whoosh of a vacuum. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, whoosh, so, whoosh. Yeah, inside it sounds odd, echoey, like there's extra static out here or air moving around. See, I, I don't hear it like when he was talking, but I know that when I was speaking and everything, I could hear it. It was like yeah. he had something on his end. No, it's on yeah. your end, not his. No, it's my it's my end. Believe it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's what it sounds like inside. Yeah, um, it was it was from my end. I had my external speakers too loud, so I cured yeah. that just by putting my headphones in. Ah. Yeah, that's why I normally listen with headphones. Um, I'm gonna have to leave in a little bit. Go get the kid. Oh, give him about twenty minutes because that'll be about the time he'll be ready. Oh, I'm gonna give him about thirty. I make him call me. Oh, you're going to wait till he calls you to say he's ready? Yeah, that way hopefully his boss is actually there. I'm not well, going to hold my breath, but... Yeah, well, think about it. Usually he says, I'm ready, and get over there, and 20, 30 minutes later, then he's ready to leave. Yeah, I told him to call me, because otherwise I ain't showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Right, bye, yeah. That way, in case he's got a ride already, or he's not ready to get off, it's always best to wait on the phone call. Well, he'll send us, you know, he'll send her a message saying, I'm ready, and then it's like, I can go over there. You know, I can wait like 10 minutes. I can go over there and it might be another 10, 15 minutes before he actually walks out. So if he says he's ready at 10 o'clock. That means probably about 1030. He's ready to walk out the door. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I know for me, it's like for me at my job. Okay. Now, if I was on like the regular schedule. Come five o'clock? No, we're all hitting that time clock and we out of there five o'clock. Yeah. Well, it's like a buddy of mine I hired, he was living in uh, my rent trailer and I told him, look, I says, uh, you got a, a, a regular job now. I said, I'm going to be picking you up at, uh, at, at either 5.30 or 6. It depends on what time of the year is it. You know, the summer right. or the fall. You know, because we've got to wait till daylight to get started because I wasn't right. about to invest in a bunch of lights, you know. Right. And anyway, <laughs> never fails. I drive up, blow the horn. The first time, it was the, the first week he was ready. I blew the horn, bump, bump, drive up to my own house where he's living at, blow the horn, he's ready. You know, because his his nail bag and all that's in my truck. Right. So all he's got to do is just come in. You know, he's got his lunch made, all that. Well, after about a week, the door would open, and he was like, you know, give me a minute. And it took him like 10 minutes to get dressed, make his lunch, sandwiches for lunch, all that. And the third time it happened, I said, look, Jamie. Do not let that happen again, because I will leave your ass here, and you're going to have to find a way to work, and if you don't show up to work, you ain't got no job. Yep. And if you don't pay your rent, you ain't got no house. Yep. Well, about two or three days, it went good. He was ready. One morning, opened the door. I put it in reverse. Like, see you. Out. Like, better show up. He had his mom bring me. Oh, she can't hear you. I got the earphones wow. on. Ah. Well, you can tell her I said hi. Okay. <laughs> she should have been watching. Oh, well. Made her said hi, baby. Hi, she said. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Crystal like that. Uh, uh, when I, I told her about how Miss is going to do that video 
cooking red beans and rice. She goes, oh, for me or for everybody? I go, well, I think she's going to do it just for, you know, for everybody out there. Yeah, we're going to throw the video on the channel. Yep. Yeah, we're going to do it here pretty soon. Yep. About another, probably another week. Okay. Oh, Crystal said Missy was talking to her on Facebook. Yeah, they were chatting earlier and everything. Um, while um, I was I was watching the uh, the biker information and everything. Um, her, those two were chatting back and forth. Right. But. Yeah, like I said, I you know, I know when you called me and everything, it's like, hang on, I'm watching Popeye right now, and I got to, you know, see what he's wanting to talk about or keep up with everything there, because when he comes oh, up yeah. and does in his live stream, that's all dealing with biker information and with me being, you know, in the biker community, I got to keep up with what's going on. And right. We're they're talking about early October uh, going down and supporting a biker that was done wrong by a highway patrolman. Okay. I, I'll play this, Cajun. The guy is a 24-year Army veteran. Okay. Right. Bronze Star, Purple Heart, Silver Star. The guy's got accolades like you wouldn't believe. Bend all the... the the hell holes the U.S. Army sent him to over in Iraq, Iran, wherever. Right. Okay. Right. Comes back. He's got high security clearance and everything. And he's got a CHL. Okay. So he was going down the road, gets pulled over, supposedly for doing seven miles over the speed limit. Okay. The. DPS officer found out, you know, because of the colors he had on his vest, uh, designating what club he was with, decided that, okay, well, you got CHL. Okay, that's another boy you're carrying. You're under arrest for carrying, illegally carrying a concealed handgun. And don't, I'm not even going to write you a ticket for the seven miles over the speed limit. But threw him in jail, even though saying he had, you know, he was illegally carrying a handgun, even though he had his license right then and there. And the officer right then and there decided to make it null and void. And he can't do that. Well, I don't know exactly what's going on with that, but if he had a concealed license, uh, yeah, he had it with him. him. Yeah, I mean, he had it with him. He they showed can't arrest that. Him for that. They're not supposed right. to arrest him for that. Right, and right, he got arrested, had his motorcycle impounded. But the thing about it is, he was never given a ticket for the seven miles over the speed limit, which is what the officer pulled him over for to begin with. Right. So I, I de we're definitely calling BS on that. Yeah, well, what they're doing, they just they just dropping the uh, the uh, PC charge, right? Okay, the probable cause charge, probable cause right. for being stopped doing right. seven mile an hour over the speed limit. They drop that. They usually do that in in a lot of cases, a DUI case, right? Uh, uh, or some other thing, like say if you uh, uh, if you were not stopped, but the reason they wanted to stop you and you didn't stop and you were uh, resisting arrest by fleeing, you know, by not stopping, they'll right. usually drop that charge and then just charge you with the uh, resisting arrest charge. Right. But which is which is bunk. Oh yeah. But like I said, you know, what we're going on, the fact is that, you know, he had his license to carry on him. Okay. Right. And I've looked it up, even had it discussed with 
uh, the instructor I went to. Okay. The way the law is here in Texas, I don't know about the other states, but the way it is here in Texas is that an officer has to put in writing why he believes that that person should not have a, a CHL and then mail it off to Austin before a review board. That review board is the one that says yes or no. The officer right then and there cannot say, okay, your license is suspended. He doesn't have the authority to do that. Yeah. Now, what you were saying about uh, the colors, uh, colors or something? The, the colors as far as designating on uh, what is on his uh, vest, which designates uh, what uh, motorcycle club he belongs to. Oh, okay. Right. Um, like here in Texas, it's red and gold. That is your dominant uh, motorcycle club. Okay. And it's just like any state out there, you're going to have one particular motorcycle club that is the dominant one. That if you want, if you're in a motorcycle club, you want to do something, you have to get a hold of um, the, the president of your local chapter, go to them and say you want to do something. You got to go to them and ask for permission to do that. It's like okay. you just can't you just can't do it on your you just you just cannot go and you know as a motorcycle club you cannot go out there and say okay we're gonna do this this and this and nobody's gonna stop us uh wrong uh if that primary if the the main motorcycle club in that, that state sees it or hears about it you're gonna be paid a visit and it's not gonna be a friendly one that hmm. I guarantee you. Well, you know, y'all have legal representation too, right? You know, that's, okay. you know that that comes out of the dues, the club dues, and all that stuff, and everything. Right. right. And usually, somebody in the club is going to be a lawyer, you know, because a lot of those motorcycle clubs have bike clubs, have doctors, lawyers, oh yeah, uh, engineers. I mean, you know. You got a club. You you got a li you got a little variety of life in there. You know. Oh yeah. Well, from like the, you know, from me, the skilled yeah. trades, I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Well, see, like for me, I'm not in a motorcycle club. I'm actually in a motorcycle ministry. Okay. Right. Right. And our president is actually the preacher at our church. Well, yeah, that's that's a right. given almost. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I say we're, we're a motorcycle ministry. We're not a motorcycle club. So we're going out there to spread the word of God and everything to the minister, to, you know, anybody who wants to listen. And I mean, if they want us to show up for some kind of event and say prayer or something like that, or, uh, say a brother goes down in an accident okay he's in the hospital okay they're going to find out who a the local motorcycle ministry is and they're going to say okay we need to contact them they're going to contact one of say one of us and they're going to say okay we've got a brother that's gone down he's at such such hospital do you have a member that can go over there and pray for him that's what we're going to do we're going to go over there and cons you know, console them. Plain and simple. That's what we're that's what we're for. Right. Hey, are you familiar with uh, Lone Star Rider? Uh, no. I think you've asked me that before, and I'm I, I'm never not heard of them. That's at uh, Riding Club. Well, we know what he does. He's on his own. Okay. Okay. And he rides for diabetes. All right. Okay. I'm going to throw his link in here. He lives around McKinney. Okay. Well, McKinney where, is about where Papa uh, Texas is at. Him and Papa Texas are good friends. Right. Well, McKinney, that's north of Dallas. And everything so that's 
Now, it's probably about an hour or so drive, depending upon how traffic is going through Dallas. Uh, McKinney. I thought McKinney was right there to the east of Dallas, midway. No, it's, uh, it's a little bit more to the north. north. It's to the north. Now, you're probably thinking of Mesquite. Now, oh, okay. Mesquite, now, now, Mesquite is to the east of Dallas, but uh, McKinney is north. Okay. Barbecue fan group. See, now, Andrew, something like that, that would be considered a riding club. Because um, in the motorcycle community, you've got, you're going to have a motorcycle, motorcycle club or MC. You're going to have a motorcycle ministry or MM. And then you're going to have a riding club, which is RC. Okay. One of the biggest RC clubs out there is the, um, uh, the Hogs. Or the Harley Owners Group. So those are the ones that, you know, like for me, I, I've been a member because I bought uh, my first bike from a Harley dealership. Well, when you do that, you're automatically enrolled. And then, you know, you can, you know, you've got the free membership for a year and then you can renew it. But they are a riding club and they, they're all with that particular uh, Harley dealership. So yeah, that's what that's what a writing club is. Hey, hey, you know, that's more power to you. You know, I don't have a problem with a writing club at all. I don't have any problem with any, you know, you've got like I say, you've got your art, you got your MCs, MMs, RCs, and then after that are gonna be your independents, which are writers that do not belong to any uh motorcycle club, ministry, or writing club. They're just out there riding on their own. Call them uh, independents or lone wolves. Oh, yeah. I see where McKinney's at now. Yeah, yeah. It's on the northeast side of uh, Dallas. Yep. It's up there a ways. And yeah. with all that road construction and everything they've been doing, because I know that um, when Chris and I, we weren't going to um, um, Muskogee last month not only to celebrate a birthday but also go up there to that renaissance festival it's like i'm looking around and i'm going this is alan now it's like then it's like wow mckinney's even growing up it's like i didn't even recognize the area because it's changed up so much over the past several years yeah uh let's see what is that over there is that uh, like Grapeland, uh, uh, talk about, uh, or Grapevine. You talk about Grapevine. Okay. That's on, that's not far from McKinney. That's what, 30 minutes or so? Uh, okay. Grapevine is, is kind of, so it's kind of in between Dallas and Fort Worth, but north, more north of. Um, uh, it's actually a little bit northwest of Irving, which sits, you know, in between. I mean, you've got Dallas, and then you've got as you're going west, you've got Irving, and then you've got the Mid Seas, which is Hershey, Lewis, Bedford. So, Grapevine is kind of north of that area. But it's still it's it's northeast of Fort Worth, and it's way uh, north. It's west northwest of Dallas, basically. Yeah, uh, Mickey Rob's Bank is from well that area. Uh, right. I don't see it right here. I thought it was off of three eighty somewhere. I Andrew, um, on your uh, your cut, do you have it where it says MC on the back of it? Does it say MC or RC on the back? Because 
Because if it's if it's an MC, then yeah, that's a motorcycle club. If it's RC, that's a riding club. And it don't matter what state you're gonna you know you're gonna find. It's either gonna say MC, MM, or RC. But the way you're putting it, as far as you know, VPs and that would probably designate it as uh, well. It, it can still be an RC because you're gonna have president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, um, road captain, SA, uh, all that for a, uh, a writing club. It's just an inside joke. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, you know, it, it depends upon what's on the back of the, the patch and everything, whether it's, uh, you know, you're an MC, RC, or MM. Hey, were you on, uh, were you watching uh, Polar Bear Ed earlier? When we were talking yeah. about the, the water-cooled uh, Kawasaki engines. Yeah. On the uh, zero turns. Yep. Now, I caught some of that, but I went up um, uh, having to do something, and I missed some of the conversation, though. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, Somebody asked a question about the water-cooled Kawasaki's on the zero turn. I think it was William I. And okay. William, William I, he used to send me, uh, you know, that's the letter I. Right. Instead of E, Y, E. And he used to send me, uh, like, hey, uh, so-and-so's going live, you know. Uh, right. You know, I, I'd like to see you up on the, ch on the, on the panel, you know. Right. So I, I jump up on the panel, uh you know, with the other mechanics and stuff. So anyway, William was in the chat and he was asking a question about the water cool Kawasaki's and Puller Bear Ed brought up the fact that the Kawasaki's, the, one of the main things you got to look for if you have a burp or air bubble in your cooling system, uh, your engine will get overheated more than likely. Yep. If it holds that burp there, you know how in your throat, if you take a sip of water and that, and you got an air bubble that goes down and it hurts like a heart attack. Oh yeah. And okay. Well, if you get an air bubble like that in the system and the engine overheats, uh, that, that gear on that camshaft uh, is going to get baked, it's right. going to get hot, overheated, and it's going to make it brittle. So either it's going to, if you catch it in time, because you got a temperature control gauge on those things, temperature gauge that you watch. Right, right. And and that's just a big zero turn. You know, the, the, the like X marks and, uh, you know, the, the commercial type zero right. turn. So he said, if your engine ever overheats, uh, most likely got to change that camshaft because of the gears, a certain type of plastic, and it's going to bake. It's going to get hot. It's going to get brittle. It's going to tear apart. Now, that's going to save your engine. Right. To, to a certain extent. Right. You know? Kind of like that, yeah. uh, that camshaft good... I was showing you. That I pulled out of that uh, Briggs and Stratton engine that was on that wood chipper. That the um, I I call it plastic, but it could be like a nylon. You know, oh yeah, yeah. Hold on gear, one sec. The, uh, lobes and everything. Hold on one sec. So Andrew, basically, what you are is a uh, what we would consider a hang around. That's someone. It's not. Uh, patched in with someone because for me the three steps are you're going to be a hang around for a certain amount of time then you're going to become a prospect and then you get a be full patch but 
But of course, that you know that depends upon the group and everything and what state you're in too. So each one is they're going to have their own time limit as far as how long you know to be a hang around, how long to be a prospect, and everything else. Because I know there are some uh, MCs out there that you have to ha be a hang around for at least a year. And then it could be a year to year and a half of uh, being a prospect and before you become a patch member. All right, I'm back. I was talking to Missy. Okay. Uh, I, I had a feeling I don't think you were talking to anybody else there. Yeah, well, true that. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of a failure point on the Kawasaki engines. Okay. Uh, where it's a it's sort of like a flywheel key, if you want to okay. imagine it as a flywheel key. If you hit something with a push mower, right. The flywheel key is going to shear, and you're not going to uh, bend your crank or uh, uh, throw it right, you know, whatever. Okay. It, it's right. going to stop running. Harmon Heat. Harmon Heat. How you doing, yeah. Monami? Yeah. So, uh, that, that gear on that camshaft is a, a fail point, and that, and that will save your engine. But when yeah. you order a new one, they send you a metal gear, a gear, a camshaft with a metal gear. Right. They change but, the design in them. Well, it's kind of like, you know, like uh, this camshaft right here. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. Up, that's, uh, of, that's out of a bridge, right? Correct. And like okay. you said. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, I remember that one. Uh, yeah. That's the one you're spraying and all that's all cockeyed on the automatic uh, compression release. Right. Behind, but, yeah. Okay, show me the compression. Let me, let me make you big right there. Okay, turn the cam so we, yeah, right there. Yeah, that's all, that looks all messed up right there. Yeah. But like I said, you know, I took this engine apart and everything, I saw that. As soon as I pulled the cover off of this, I'm going plastic on the the gear oh, yeah. for the camshaft and the, the lobes. lobes. Yeah. I'm going, man, that is. Now, wait, is that, that a good? Man. That is, that that good is that's messed up. What, what horsepower that came out of? I think it was a five horse. Uh, like a five and a half, something like that. All right. Something like that, it, yeah. Now, is the spring still good on that? Yeah. I don't remember it looking like that. It still goes back and forth. Yeah. I mean, because, I'm talking about. Because right here, I don't know how good you're going to see it. Oh. Now with your hand in the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. But anyways, right there, that's where a spring is at. So, you know, I can push here on the bottom, pull it back, and that spring pushes it back over. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, that's. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a good cam. Unless the lobes are wore out. The compression release is good. Right. But I don't know, you know, to me, being plastic, uh, I ain't going to take a chance on it. It's like, uh-uh, give me more steel teeth. You know, one that's all made out of steel. Well, the only way you're going to find that is through, uh, if you can match the numbers up to, uh, That um, that Briggs engine, I like I said, I'm not even worried about it because, like I said, you know, um, I knocked I was, myself out. Right? Yeah. Um, hey, Alexander. Um, but hey, me, Alexander. I was going, you know, like I said I I was gonna get it going with one of those Predator 212s, but then I found out that the crankshaft output was different between the two. So that predator wasn't going to work. Right. Well, not I, I, just, I said, you know, basically to hell with it. And I just want going over to um, 
I found a Harbor Freight that had one of their own wood chippers. And it's like, I just went going over there. And this was last year, right after they rolled out the, um, the nationwide credit card and everything. I went over there, filled out the paperwork. And it's like, here's my credit app. They, they said, okay, you've been approved for, I think it was like $800. And it was like, I think $499 for the wood chipper. It's like, okay. So, boom. I wound up getting that. And okay, you, got, had the, yeah, you had the horizontal shaft on that one. Yeah, okay, it's a horizontal and that shaft. That end was on the wood chipper. You had the horizontal yeah. shaft, okay? And yep. you had the uh, flow jet carburetor on it. Uh, it I was don't a long, what uh, a long tube. The where was it choke at? Oh no, it was actually uh, kind of like the uh, carburetor that you've got on the uh, the Predator engine. A bowl type. Yeah, it's got. It had a bowl. Okay, but. Now, I'm not going to go digging for that thing. I, no, no, no. I, I got no, no idea no. where it's at, okay. but I ain't going digging for it. Was the carburetor the style that bolted screwed to the tank? Uh, the gas tank? No. 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 It had, uh, okay. I believe it had right. a line. Right. Now, like what you're All talking right. about is like what's on this, um, this Craftsman uh, tiller I got back over here. Now, that's the kind that the uh the gas tank is to that uh carburetor and yeah, that's the carburetor right. is about, about yay long and it's about, yeah. about that big around yeah and yeah, yeah that's a that's a pulse jet i call it a right. flow so, jet but it's a pulse right. jet so no oh, it, 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 yeah it, you it, have the little you have that little diaphragm that goes there right on top of it you change right. that out yeah okay yeah i got kits for that i got the the diaphragms or the the jets and you know the whole kit for it right uh and we, we keep those in stock right but i mean like i said i wound up you know when i found out that the um uh, the uh the crankshaft was different on the output between the two and the um i guess you call it the flywheel the one's got all the uh the blades and everything on it the that, auger was, not, that was not going to mount onto it so I was like, right. oh crap. So that's why I went going to Harbor Freight and getting one of theirs. Right, right. And it's already got the Predator 212 on it. So it's like, okay. Uh, I know that I went to went to go start it up the other day. It ran for a few seconds and then died. And of course I hadn't run it for about three months. So I probably got, you know, some stuff in the carburetor. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll pull the carburetor off of it. And take it apart, put it in my ultrasonic cleaner. It's probably got some uh, varnish or whatever. Um, I'll put it all back together and put it back on and start it up and run like new. Yeah. What uh, What was the reason that you took that Briggs engine apart for? Uh, I was just curious to find out what went wrong with it. Because, like I said, it, no matter what I did, that well, thing what was not What happened? What happened? It just stopped wanting to run. Plain and simple. Oh. It just did not want, no matter what I did, um, I couldn't get the thing to start up and run. So I just you, said, you know, the hell with it and just let it sit. And I just, like I said, I want to. Uh, you still have the engine? Later, so I, okay, fine. I'll get it running again. Matter of fact, I wound up doing a video on it uh, early last year. And that's when I found out that the output shaft on the, the crank was different. It was like, oh, never mind. This ain't going to work. All right. Okay. Uh, so it just wouldn't run anymore. You redid the carb. No, I'm saying I'm going to redo the carb on the, the hard. No, 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 no. Not that one. You said you couldn't get it to run. Correct. Did you overhaul the carb? on the Briggs engine. No, I didn't. Because at that time, I hadn't been watching uh, videos on YouTube to learn. But oh, okay. since then, it's like, you know, I've been watching, you know, Musty One, Seen Brandon, and a couple of other channels. It's Darryl. like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I'm going, 
damn, is that all that you know it takes to redo this? Because you know I've taken, you know, I've had a a generator. I've got a little um, 1800 watt generator that I picked up from uh, Tractor Supply probably six years ago. A champion, and, right? A champion. And so, you know, for camping and everything. Because I don't, you know, when I go camping, I don't need a lot of power. Okay. So 1800 watt generator. That's plenty big for what I need. Okay. Was, the name, of it, was the name of it Champion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but anyway, no you know, I went to go use it and everything. I went to go start it up and nope. So I was like, okay, I pulled the carburetor off, took the bowl out, you know, took that all apart and I sprayed cleaned everything. It's like, okay, put everything back together, put it back on. It would run, but not correctly. But the thing I didn't know is about that main jet you have to take out. Right. So if I'd known about that, it, that's probably where the problem is. I need to pull that carburetor off of there and take it, you know, all apart, take that jet and everything out, put it in ultrasonic cleaner. I can guarantee you that I do all that, I put it back together. I think it's going to run perfect. Yeah. Uh, Alexander saying champions, cheap junk. It depends on which one you get. Right. It just depends now, on which one you get. Right. Now, hey, Andrew, now, I had that, you know, I've had that champion for. No, Alexander. Uh, not Andrew, Alexander. Uh, okay, Alexander, sorry. Um, but anyways, I had that, uh, I, I went camping with that uh, champion for about two or three years, no problem with it. Had not a single problem at all. It just, I happened to, it sat, and I didn't turn, I guess I didn't turn the fuel off on it, let it run out, whatever. And it just sat for about a year or two, and it's like, okay, time to get it, you know, go camping again. And no, no, no start. start. It, it would run, but it would run real bad and everything. Uh, it was like you had to keep the choke on it just to keep it running. So I was like, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. I'll, it's probably it's got gummed you know, up. right gummed I, up. I hear, like, I hear myself echoing on your side. Do you? Yeah. Do you have that same speaker on or something or whatever? No, I've got that turned. It's not even turned on, and I've got the uh, YouTube. Can you, lower your, can you how how loud can you hear me? I can hear you real good. Okay. Uh, on your top keyboard, the top of your keyboard on your laptop. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The eighth button from the left. That's a volume minus control. Yeah. Tap that. Go down to about 70%. Okay. All right. Now let me see if I can hear you echoing now, or okay. me, or you. You 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 talk also. Okay. So, do you hear any echoing right now? Nope. I think that fixed the problem. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I I can still hear you, no problem. So yeah, I've got it down to. Uh, yeah, but I heard a little echo on your side. Okay. I heard myself echoing. Is what I did. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. But yeah, I mean, like I said, I've got that uh, that little generator. Or so I'll, it, that's probably all it needs. Probably just pull the carburetor off of it. And yeah, since I know you. now about the main jet, you know, get in there and unscrew it and everything. Like I said, that's probably where the whole problem is. But like I said, you, you know, probably you, know, you probably don't even need to do that. You just throw the carb in, you know, without the bowl on it naturally. Oh uh, yeah, without without the needle and float and all that. Yep. And throw it in your ultrasonic cleaner for three cycles. Now, those cycles are what, 15 minutes on those? Uh, the one that I've got is, um, I think it's eight minutes is the longest. Yeah, eight minutes. Uh, no, I think it's longer than that. My, my, uh, I have now, one just one like you got. got. Okay, just I've like got you the, got. Okay, I've got the Central Pneumatics, and that's the one that's from. Yeah, uh, all the free. All like the freight. So yeah, you got the two and a half liter or whatever it is. Yeah. So yeah, it came, I think it came in a basket with no handles on it. <laughs> right. So yeah. that one there, it's eight minutes is um 
No, no we, we go, we, well, I read the instructions on mine. I think it's 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the one, if it's the same one, I mean, it's, you can only go up to 480 seconds and that's eight minutes. Okay. Mine, mine might be a different model. I you think might have 15, a different model there. I think it's 15 minutes per, per cycle. And we had a, oh man, we had one hell of a problem with an outboard carb one day. No, did you? motor, yeah, on a 15 horse. I think it was a 15 horse. No, 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 no. This was on a V4, a 115. Oh. Uh, Evan Root. And we had one of the cars, it would not run right. So I'm like, well, well that's when we got the uh, ultrasonic cleaner. We ran it through, through three cycles. And that motor purred like a kitten, baby. Yep. You know, like I said, yeah, I started watching uh, Musty One. This was probably. I'll be right back. About two or three years ago. Oh, yeah. But no, I started, like I said, I started watching Musty One probably about two, three years ago. And it's like, you know, he was all, you know, at that time, yeah, he was talking, you know, doing like riding line mowers and push mowers. I mean, I know he's still doing it, but. I know he's doing boats and snow blowers and weed eaters and all that kind of stuff. But at the time, it was like more onto uh, the Rhine lawn mowers and push mowers. And it's like, you know, I was, I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I can learn. And it's like, oh, wow. I didn't know there was a main jet you had to unscrew and everything. Of course, at the time, I didn't have an ultrasonic cleaner. Um, I didn't get mine until earlier this year, I say probably around March, March, April, something like that. And that's when I wound up getting it because, um, Brandon from BS small engines, he's down and clean. Well, I wound up going down there visiting with him, seeing his after he'd been talking about how good it was and Harbor Freight there running a sale. Okay, fine. So I went and got that. And so, yeah, that's, you know, like I said, learning from all that. Um, I mean, like I said, from watching what Musty One was doing, a matter of fact, uh, the owner's son where I work at, he was complaining about his push mower not wanting to run. It's like, okay, well, I started doing the same process, okay, process of elimination, okay? Do we have fire? You know, pulled the spark plug out, kind of grounded it, pulled, okay, we got spark. Okay, do we have fuel? Got a little bit of gasoline, poured it in the um, the cylinder, just hand tighten the spark plug, put the wire back on, pulled it, started ramp just long enough for that gasoline to burn out. Okay, fine, it's in the carburetor. So pull the carburetor apart and had some, uh, you know, brake cleaner, you know, same thing as carb cleaner, but different name. Only thing I did, it, it was that plastic. They all plastic carburetor. So basically all I did, you know, there was no way taking the needle and everything out. So you know, I just took it all apart, sprayed it, hit it with the air gun and everything, put it all back together, put it back on, it ran fine. Okay, I missed a lot of that. Uh, did you say plastic carb? Yep. Was that a Br Briggs & Stratton E-series engine? Uh, it could be, I, that's been about a year and a half ago when I messed okay. with that. Uh, it was a push mower, right? Push mower? Yeah, push mower. Okay. Then as you was pushing it, so you behind it pushing it, the carb was on the left side of the motor, on the port yeah. side. Yep. All right. Okay. That's the E-series. Yes. The needle and float does come out. Right. I'm saying they but the main jet. There's no main jet to pull out. Yeah, there is. Okay, yeah, I didn't see is. one. It's a cartridge. It's oh, a is cartridge. It? Yeah, it's a double cartridge with a flat white oval. It looks like a tablet. Uh, Tylenol. Yeah. Looks like like a huge Tylenol from the top. Okay. It's oval, like not oval. Uh, 
uh, whatever they call a Tylenol tablet. Capsule, okay. capsule, capsule, yeah. uh, whatever that shape is. It's a long oval. Right. All right. It's elongated. Yeah, that right. pops right out. That'll pop out with a, a little mini screwdriver. Okay. And then they had a ball bearing right on top in the middle of it, or almost in the middle. They got a ball bearing on top. And then they have a side jet on it and a bottom jet. That needs to be popped out. The ball bearing needs to be popped out. And then you can take a piece of bread, bread tie. Right. The wire of it. I use jet to uh, jet drills. Okay. Right. I, I do it the right way. I, I use. Okay. Somebody's going to say, no, don't do this in the comments when this is a video. Somebody's going to say, no, don't use torch tip cleaner. I know how to use those things. I've yep. been doing this a long time. Okay. And I know not to take the brass out of it or whatever it's made of, usually brass. I right. take the gum out of it, the varnish. That's all I'm taking right. off. Yep. Okay. Just like using a bit, a thumb drill bit. Drill bits you use with your thumb. You know, you don't put them in a machine, a Dremel tool, or nothing. You have this one little tool that you put your thumbs on and your forefinger, and you just screw it in, and that's it. You're not taking any brass out. You're not oversizing the jet at all. In fact, if you oversize it by just, say, a uh, uh, hundred thousandths of an inch, you know, very minute, you might be helping that thing. <laughs> Because right. those jets are so small, any little bitty piece of trash can get in there. And now on your tanks, you have a little filter on top of them. Most of them do. And But if that lawnmower is set for any amount of time, yeah. So, yeah. But, man, I love those cars. Brandon likes them, too. B.S. Oh, yeah. and he likes them. At oh, yeah. first. At first, the first one I ever did, I'm like, okay, uh, I don't think I'm liking this, this style yeah. of car. But now, you know, after the second one, third one, I love them. They very yeah, yeah. easy to work on. And they're made oh. out of plastic. There's no corrosion yeah. going on in there. Right. Like with a metal bowl. Right. And, you know, like you said, you know, I didn't, you know, know about that. So now that you know, I know about it. Okay, fine. I know how to, you know, take care of it. Because I remember seeing that white piece down in there, but I didn't know what it was. I thought the way it felt and everything, I thought it was glued in there where it wasn't going to come out. So I didn't want to take a chance of breaking it. And, right. But I didn't want to take a chance of it breaking. It's like, okay, that carburetor screwed up. Yeah. Okay. You can go like when you're looking through the venturi of the car, straight uh -huh. through it from the filter part. Filter right. side to the block side. Right. You're gonna see that. You're gonna see that little that little dangle, like in the back of your throat. You're gonna right. see that little dangle in in there, and you pop that up with a screwdriver. Okay. It will pop right out. And you got an O ring on it too. Right. You know. So you're not well, gonna hurt the O ring like that. And it snaps right, right back in. It snaps right. level like that right. but you take the ball bearing out you spray it with carb cleaner and right. you can look through the jets and there's two little jets look through there now i think they only got one or some of them had three no you only got two i've got them in stock i'll keep them in stock yeah. let me uh let me try to find hey alexander you'd probably like um uh, what uh the boss and his son uh go racing they do the um, road course, and what their cars look like is the old um, Formula. Uh, they're they're called Formula Vs, but they use a Volkswagen engine. But the weird thing about it is they've redone the gearbox and everything in them, to where instead of the engine being in the back, the engine's actually in the front and the transaxle's in the back. So they reversed all that and. They've done the gear changes up in the transaxle. 
So, and they're actually going out there and racing them, but they have the the old um, formula style uh, round bodies from back in the uh, like the fifties and sixties. Well, I used to go on dirt track years ago, but to get back into dirt track racing now, way too much money. When I say too much money, I checked to see about getting a roll cage put in the car, and I was told anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. And I'm going when I was back racing, I think I was looking at about six hundred dollars, and Back then, that was a lot of money. Now you're talking about fifteen hundred, two thousand. I'm going, and we're talking a totally different roll cage. And the guys, they're going to spend anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars on their engine. But yeah, like I said, um, he runs that Volkswagen engine. Oh, I love a Volkswagen. I yeah. do. The, the bugs, the old bugs. Oh, yeah. Yep. Now, i tell you what's real funny is that you've got a, um, my boss, okay, actually in his son's car, and he's got that Volkswagen engine that's in there. And I think it's the uh, 1500cc engine. And he told me that. I'm going, hold it. You're on a 1500cc Four cylinder in a race car. He goes, Yeah. I said, That's kind of funny. Some of the fact is that I've got a two cylinder Harley that's got a bigger engine in it. I'm pushing 1600 out of two cylinders, and you've got 1500 out of four. It was like, That's what really surprised me. Yeah, I mean, like I said, with um, Musty One, like I said, I started watching him, and like I said, Terrell, uh, Brandon, um, there's been a couple of others I've watched uh, their videos on, um, and it's like, wow, I did not realize how simple and easy it is to work on these engines. Oh, and yeah. Well, when you know how, yeah. I mean, to just somebody regular, uh, you know, that, that's never messed with it before. Right. And Alexander, yeah, concerning the fact that um, Ferdinand Porsche, back in 1932, he was the uh, guy that Adolf Hitler went to and had him build uh, the port, the uh, Volkswagen Beetle, and but at that time it was an imposed two-cylinder. And the um, Porsche 911, uh, it was actually the uh, predecessor to the Carmen Ghia. Carmen Ghia actually was around before he had the Porsche 911. And actually, there's not much difference between a, a Volkswagen boxer engine and the Porsche engine. I mean, they're basically identical. I mean, there's some things I know they're going to change for more performance, but basically they take a Volkswagen engine and then they'll change things up on it. Maybe the heads are going to be different, you know, different exhausts. I don't know, but basically, it's, it's a Volkswagen engine. And I tell you what's really interesting is the um, uh, the German staff car that they, uh, uh, I think it was a Mercedes that they had in World War II. A lot of people don't know it, but they actually had two engines in the car really they yeah it had the um uh, 
the Volkswagen engine in the rear, okay, and they actually had a steam engine in the front, okay, because they were, you know, limited on fuel and everything, the staff officers and generals, whatever. So, you know, they were constantly doing all this driving, but they were limited on amount of fuel. So the, the idea behind that was that, okay, they could fill the car up and keep, you know, they could go, but if they ran out of gasoline or petrol over there, well, Germany was mostly uh, forest, okay? So all you got to do is go out there and find some uh, tree limbs that have fallen, they're dead and everything. You put it in the, uh, the steam engine, fire that thing up, once you got enough steam built up, you keep on going because that engine there, it actually drove the front tires. I didn't know that. Yep. I didn't know it either until someone told me. I'm like, oh, do what? I checked out. Yep, it is true. Um, you seen the movie uh, My Cousin Vinny? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> With, uh, Joe Pitchy? Yep. Yeah. But you, me you remember the car at the very end that um, uh, uh, Marissa Tomei, what she was describing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it was the uh, Pontiac, uh, what, Tempest? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Chevy Tempest. No, it was oh, Pontiac. Pontiac. Pontiac, yeah, yeah. Right. Compared, compared to a Chevy something else was, or something. No, it was the uh, Buick. Buick, uh, that's it. Buick. I think it was Scott. the Buick that they had. Scott One thing about it is, right. But yeah, you know, how she was saying that it has an independent rear suspension. Okay. What's real funny is I actually I was at my local junkyard one time before they closed up. They had a Pontiac Tempest sitting in there. And I looked, I was like, okay, I'm just curious. I went over. That thing actually did have an independent rear suspension. Just like a Corvette. I was totally surprised that they actually got that information correct. Mm, okay. The Buick Skylark. Thank you. Yep. Because the Pontiac Tempest and Buick Skylark, yeah, they were basically the the same car, the same body. Yeah. Didn't I but, say Skylark earlier? <laughs> uh, you said, well, you say in a Chevy. No, no. Was, uh, after, Tempest. yeah, no. And then I said uh, Buick Skylark. Okay. I, right. If you did, I didn't hear you say it. Okay. But, but yeah, I mean, it's the fact that, yeah, I mean, they're both made by General Motors. Like what was said in the movie, but like I said, what really surprised me was, yeah, it actually did have an independent rear suspension. So that's one that's one movie fact that is true, but that car only did it did only have the force owner in it. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble finding that part. And what part are you looking for? I'm looking just for that cartridge. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm looking for IPL. Okay. Illustrated, illustrated parts list. Okay. Now, you're talking about a cartridge. Something I learned uh, the other day. Uh, you know, I got this 2009 Dodge Caliber. And I made a couple of trips with it. And... All of a sudden, I'll get the like a temperature light come on. It was like, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, the car will start to slow down, but the RPMs will still be high up there, and the car will just want to creep on its own. Well, you know, I wound up doing a look on uh, YouTube and did not know that there are two filters for the transmission on that. You've got ones inside the transmission itself, but there's another, car, it's a cartridge style that goes to your transmission cooler. So, 
So I'm fixing to be doing a transmission service on my little Dodge Caliber probably um, next weekend after I get paid. Yep. Like I said, Andrew, that was something that, you know, I was surprised to actually see that car. And it's like, man, this thing does have an independent rear suspension. Mona Lisa Vita was correct. <laughs> oh, everybody run and hide. <laughs> I got trouble coming in. No, you got a very pissed B -R -O -U, off. B -R -E. yeah. okay. Good news. I talked to the district manager. Oh, really? Uh-huh. I told him if I have to confront her, it's not going to be nice. Because if I have to confront her about her being late, after her bragging that she's there on time every time she's scheduled, I will make her cry and make her quit. I hope so. Make her move back to Louisiana? No, I don't want to inflict her on boo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's my son's assistant manager at the fast food place he works at. And she's a relief. She comes in at 10 o'clock. She's supposed to come in at 10 o'clock. And oh. we were having problems right after he got hired about getting his schedule straight, when he was coming in, what Daisy was coming in, because they would change the schedule on him. So I went in there. I said, you're going to fix this. I don't care what you do, what else you do, but you're going to fix this. And... 10 o'clock, he is to be out the door because he's a minor and he still has two years of school. So he is to be out the door at 10 o'clock, no later. And okay, no problems. Yep. I just got through telling the, telling the district manager that he needs to get it straight because I've got 15 years in management. Over half of that is in fast food. And you show up five to ten minutes before your shift, and if you stay late, that's overtime. Yep. So. That's right. Okay, I found that sucker. Yep. You see what Alexander uh, said? Mm, nope. Yeah, put a boot up her arse, rear end. Oh, forget, uh, forget it. I ain't going to bother with the boot, honey. He's got plenty of plenty of wood in here. I'll just smack her upside the back of the head. That's true. And if she pisses me off enough, it takes five pounds of pressure to knock someone out if you're hitting their throat. Yep. All right, I'm going to share this real quick. All right, well, y'all have fun. All right. All right. You want to hurry uh, up to bed soon because you got to go to work in the morning. Yeah, no. And it's, it's already 11. Lit. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Yeah, it's school night for me. I got to be at work early in the morning. Six thirty, we'll roll around early. Yes. And okay, let me. I'm six. Let me make that big. Bye, boo. Bye, Miss Crystal. All right. All right. You see where? You see that right there? Yep. Okay. You see where my cursor's at? Yeah. Okay, right there. And then it goes up here. Right. Right there. All right. That comes apart right there. Oh, does it? Yeah. Once it you get once you get your O ring right here, once all of it this comes out, this uh -huh. breaks apart. Okay. And you okay. see that little jet right up here? Yeah. A little brass jet. And then you're going to yeah. have one in here, too. They used to okay. on, on some of them, but they changed it. And But uh, right here on top is where you have a ball bearing. Right. A little BB up there. A stainless steel or whatever ball bearing. Right. And you pop that out from up here. You go up here with a torch tip cleaner with a big one or something that small go up here and you pop that ball bearing out of there and 
there's usually trash up in this area right here. And okay. in here, here. You blow all that out, and guess what? You that are done. That takes care of the whole problem. Yep. Oh. That's what I well, like about yeah, that right there. Well, see, like I said, you know, that, that's, you know, I'm learning something there. Because, like I said, you know, I didn't know about it. I looked at that. I'm going, plastic carburetors, like, damn, they're getting cheap. It's like. Actually, I like that concept. I do. Because nothing can no get corroded. corroded. Yep, corroded. No corrosion. And yep. it's, not, it's not just plastic, like on the camshaft gears. It's right. not that it's plastic. It's a certain type of plastic, you know, like a right. nylon, a ABS, or, you know, they got all different grades of plastic. They got some oh, yeah. plastics that I'm not going to say tougher than aluminum, you know, or steel, but there's stuff that will withstand uh, quite a bit of beating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like those. The only thing I don't like about the plastic gear on those camshafts, on the Briggs engines, and they've been doing that. That's been a long time, a very long time. 20, I'm going to say right at 20 years, they've been using plastic gears on camshafts. Talk about where but that epoxy will come loose. And they are epoxied on that. Right. They got teeth. And, but the epoxy on there, that gear to the shaft itself, where the lobes are. And if you hit something very hard, yeah, uh, it, it's going to, that that gear is going to stop, but the cam is going to keep on going. Yep. yep. You know, because of the valves that are controlling the cam. Right. right. And it's going to be off look like this much that's oh, it yeah. i mean yep. you can just look at it and you're gonna say oh well the, all the teeth are good and this and that well that's how hard that plastic is it wasn't enough to break the teeth but it was enough to get that gear to slip on the uh the metal shaft and you, on the right, and you metal can't tell shaft. yep and, and there's it, no way you're gonna tell Unless you, have a brand, unless you have a brand new one to compare it to. Correct. Or a known good one. That's right. why you tear apart an engine. Uh, if the cam's good in it, like say, uh, I don't know, got a rod through the block. Ran low in oil, okay? Right. Through a rod. All right? If the cam's not messed up, you can reuse it. And the only way to check it is to put it in an engine and try it. <laughs> but, uh, but most of the time the cam's going to be good. All right? right. Oh, most of the time, a lot of them, if you get a rod, you get a thrown rod, uh, that rod's going to mess up the crankshaft, the camshaft, you know, yep. if it doesn't go through the block. So anyway, uh, if you have a known good cam, you can compare your cam with that one. Right. Now, if this cam is, I mean, I haven't gotten rid of the engine or anything. I've just still got it in pieces and everything when I took it apart. Um, but to me, it's like, I don't feel like Ian Prime worry about putting this thing back together. Well, if we ever meet up, put it everything in a box. Okay. A large flat rate box in the post office is free. Put the block in it or put the block. Yeah, because you can take the block because it's a horizontal shaft. You take the block, right. put all the parts in the block. You don't even have to close the box, you know. And we'll meet up one day and if you don't want the engine, I'll take it. I got no use I, I guarantee you. I guarantee you I can get it running. Hey, I'll give it to you because, like I said, I got no use for it. I don't want it. And it's like, it's just, I know I got that block here somewhere, and it's just collecting dust. 
Brian's World and Mechanics. What's going on, mon ami? How you doing? Man, these bugs. Got a lot yeah, of bugs flying around. We talking about uh, small engines? Yep. We're talking about other stuff first, and then, you know, we have to get into the small engine talk. Oh, yeah. Hence the title. <laughs> how you doing, Brian? Hey, Brian. How you doing? But yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, said, you know, I don't mind doing something like that because, like I said, I have no use for it. I mean, only thing I was going to do is I was going to strip it down and, you know, take the aluminum and sell it for scrap metal. That's about the only oh, thing I was going to yeah. do, but just haven't done it yet. Hey, Brian, check your email, buddy. I hadn't seen you in a while. I want to see you up here. But, um, yeah, I, I'd be willing to do that. Yeah, just hold on to it, you know, because one of these days we're going to meet up. Oh, yeah. And I'll have me a five-horse engine, five, five-and-a-half-horse engine. Yeah. Like I said, I got no use for it, and, you know, I got a feeling you might know somebody. Like I said, you might know someone around there would have all the gaskets and everything put it back together. Oh, uh, actually, you that, buddy down the road. Uh, my buddy down the road might have a uh, the overhaul kit. Yeah, but uh, if he don't, I can get one because I don't have that that overhaul kit for that particular engine. I don't. Right. I've got the overhaul kits for all the push mower engines. Right. But, yeah, like I said, you know, I've, I've got it all. Was like, I, like I said, I've got no use for it. I don't, I don't want it. Yeah, just put it in the corner somewhere and forget about it until I remind you. Because that's a good engine. It's a horizontal shaft, you know. Right. That's a damn yeah. good engine. Right. Now, and I'm surprised, yeah. and I'm surprised. Uh, that the carburetor wasn't screwed onto the tank. It wasn't. Um, but, okay. Let me reach down here. Oh. Hey, Brian, I ain't seen you in a while, my brother. Check your email. I, I need to talk to you about something, too. I got that Jeep finally fixed. Uh, well, I say fixed. It wasn't even what I thought it was. Oh, there he is. What's up, fellas? What's right, going Cajun. on, my brother Brian? Hey, Brian. Living the dream. I hear you. Oh, oh. Let me present him. Hey, Brian. Brian's World in Mechanics. Meet Mater's Workshop. What's up, Mater? How you doing? Good, Not yourself? much. Okay. There's, there's a crankshaft. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but that, like I said, that one there, you know, you can see how it, it, it's flat here, but then yeah, it ta tapers, tapers down. down. Tapers, tapers down, down, and then you got the keyway. Okay. Right. But when I took the, uh, the cutting head and everything off of it, there was no keyway. There was nothing here, and inside the cutting head, it did not have a slot and everything for a keyway. So oh, so that don't ha that don't have a keyway. It's a press fit. Right, it's a press fit. Like That's a, why it's tapered. Like a generator. Right. Yeah, that's, what, so, that's why a lot of lawnmowers, you know, they hit a rock or something, it throws the flywheel off because there's no uh, there's no keyway to keep them in place. No, in lawnmowers no. you do have a keyway. On lawnmowers okay. you do have a keyway. Mm -hmm. Right now, you, you do have. The, here's a keyway for. That's for the flywheel. Wheel. Yeah. Right. Here's the flywheel side. Okay. But this right. is on the end where this, like I said, this is coming off of a wood chipper. Yeah. Like so the blade side where, on right, a lawnmower. This is where a cutting head. Yeah. Right. Well, is, okay. Now that's meant to slip. Okay. It's meant yeah. to slip. It's a tapered fit, press fit, but it's meant to slip. Yep. What's up, Alexander? What's up, Andrew? Now, uh, your lawnmowers, no, your, your, your push mowers will have a keyway 
for your blade on, boss. Okay. On my, on my two and a half horsepower Tecumseh that was on my Craftsman lawnmower, on the flywheel side, it didn't have a keyway. On the flywheel so side, had, but that's a Tecumseh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So every time, every time I'd hit a rock or something, it would throw that freaking it would throw that flywheel out and I would have to take it apart and put it back together, time it, time it back up to get it to run correctly again. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a flywheel that didn't have a key unless mm -hmm. that's a Tecumseh I've never worked on in my life. I'm good at so like uh, Generators, like mm -hmm. your Jenny, your Jenny part, will go on your like uh nowadays you don't see a whole lot of five horsepower generators because you got like six thousand watt seventy five hundred watt seventy two hundred yeah. watt generators and that's all at least ten to you know eighteen horsepower engines Briggs right. engines or whatever but it don't matter the engine is still a tapered fit on the yeah. PTO side you know not the flywheel side the PTO side Right. You know, the business end of the engine. Reason straight. Yep. Yeah. Hey, did uh, you have did that one uh is that an L head or is that is that an L head engine? Uh okay, all right. Let me let me refresh your memory. The L heads or the flat heads. Uh the other engines are OH the overhead valve. Well, here's the, uh, nope, because. What is that's that? OHP, oh, that? that should say overhead valve. Bricks and oh, that's a valve cover. Oh, okay, that's an yeah. overhead okay, valve. Just, I thought it was, okay. Just okay. Valve. Yeah, hence your new style carburetor on that thing. Right. You know, instead of the carburetor that's screwed onto the tank. Right. You know, the, the, uh, the Pusser Jet car. You have a bow right. car. You have a flow jet. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I got yeah, tired I of saying, rebuilding, you know, that, rebuilding that damn carb on that lawnmower. I think I put, because I just went on eBay and I'd buy the damn carburetor for 20 bucks and bolt the sucker on and be done with it. But earlier yeah. years, like the earlier years, you know, those are expensive carbs, so you want to rebuild them. But the later years, one, they were all plastic garbage. So. Yeah, which one are you talking about, Brian? To come say motor. That oh, come say. Uh, oh, okay. I rebuilt it the first time, and I think I opened the jet up too much because it was, even though it ran great, it was pouring out black smoke. So, uh, but I went over with a damn jet drill and opened the jet up to get it cleaned out. Yeah, and you I opened it up. Right. You opened it up too much. Yeah. Yes, sir. There you go. There's the there's the head. Yep, sure the is. Of it. Overhead valves. Well, everything's a yep. part, so I could do I can do a uh I can true that head up. I can uh redo the valves, lap the valves. I mean it's mm -hmm. already a part. I mean that that part of the job is done. The yeah, I've already done part. half the work for you. Like I said, the hardest done part is done. Yeah. Yeah, and that, uh, when I seen that flywheel, okay, that, that engine right there, is that yeah. the, uh, is that the 30 degree cylinder on it? What do you mean? Okay, does it look like a newer Predator uh, engine for a go-kart? Does it look like that? The cylinder coming off of the block, is it at a 30 degree angle? Look, yeah. watch me. Watch me. Okay, here's the block. Okay, uh, yeah. like this. Does the head, the cylinder come off at a 30 degree angle like this? Yeah, I've got the block. I'm trying to remember where I put it the other day. I've got okay. it still in here. Yeah, it, it looks like a, the, a Honda engine or yep. Predator yep. nowadays. Okay, yeah, that's a 30 degree yep. angle block. I don't know where I've got Oh, I know Alexander. He already stripped it. Makes my job a lot easier. In fact, that one there, I might... Uh, oh. All I got to do is put new rings on it 
and put it back together. Yep. Yep. That's yep. 30 degree. Yep. That's 30 degree angle uh, cylinder block. Yep. Sure is. Yep. Yep. I tell you what, I might even uh, go through, uh, I'm going to try to find my old uh, <coughs> high performance engine part company because I don't think it's uh, uh, power or go power or whatever we was talking about earlier tonight on uh, right. Pull, Pull a Bear Ed's channel. Right. right. This is when I was building uh, racing engines uh, back in uh, uh, 93, 94. Yeah. And, uh, 95. Uh, if I can find that company, if it's still in existence, and I want to say it was performance parts or something, and and it was for racing carts and mini bikes. You can buy mini bikes. I never did any of those. What those uh those the those racing, souped up racing souped carts. Up, Super yeah, racing racing cars. And shit like that. Yeah, the five horse. Yeah, correct. Uh, the company I was looking at, it was uh, Go Power Products or something. And I know we'd go to race night and there'd be some kids there that their parents, have, you know, they got these little dragsters. And they put oh, their, yeah. They put the yeah. Kids in with the Briggs and Stratton motor and everything. And right. Well, Mater. Run a NOS on them and all kinds of craziness. Yeah. Well, Mater's got <laughs> one. He's got a, a V Twin Predator. Brand new. Uh, he's got a blower he wants to put on it, and he wants to make his uh, drag car frame. Oh, interesting. Uh, because he's a little wide. You know, he don't want to be in a little kitty dragster. You know, like for a 10-year-old, yeah, right. he wants to be, like, in the uh, teenage or adult class with that 23 or 24 horsepower with a blower on it. Running yep. uh, methanol alcohol. Yeah. Nitro methane. Everything, everything, everything I was building was 500 horsepower or bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But well, you were a, a V8, V6, straight six, or four cylinder mechanic. Yeah, yeah. We, we're talking about one and two cylinder. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what I want to do, uh, Brian, is. Uh, I basically want to build a uh, a mini top fuel dragster, mm -hmm. and but the only problem that I'm trying to figure out is the drive line system yeah. because I don't want it. I'm not going to put the engine in it where you've got the crankshaft coming out the side and having a chain going back to the rear end. I want it mm -hmm. to where it's sitting in the frame like this, and I'm right in front of it. So I want the crankshaft running parallel to the frame. Yeah. So I got to try and figure out some kind of a, a driveline system going to a ring and pinion uh, style rear end. Huh. Some kind of a clutch system to a gearbox to the rear end. I've got an idea. The only thing is I've got to, there's something I got to try and find. Yeah. And of course, you know, I'm doing this all in my own pocket because I don't have any sponsorship for it. It's just something I want to try and do and get it built and see how it does. Because mm. the reason I got the idea on doing something like that is have you ever seen the guys from Cars and Cameras? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, um, I don't want watch a lot of tv so no no this, this is on youtube oh is it yeah there's a couple of guys uh john and isaac they're up on the uh east coast uh -huh. and they that's basically what they do they do go-karts mini bikes and you know i've seen them doing you know all the predator 212s and everything yeah, how the they're doing the only person, the only person i would know of to talk to would be uh uh, Stacy, Twisted okay. R racing, but I don't okay. know. I don't. I don't know as far as how he's how far he's gotten. He used to get into racing lawn mowers and shit like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, he was he was in a go kart 
uh, racing sprint cars like the Margate carts. But uh, no, he's he he's no longer on YouTube, Brian. Yeah, I know he 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 screwed his shoulder up real bad, and he's had some issues at home. So, well, what happened was, yeah, he did screw his shoulder up. He fell off of his uh, eighteen wheeler trailer. Yeah. But when he retired and he announced, look, boom, I'm done with YouTube. Family time now. I'm retired. Family yeah. time. Yeah. So, okay, Alexander Smith, you're talking about Go Power. Uh, uh, let me see. I just had it up here. Go Power Sports. No, uh, unless they change their parts and that they rearrange what they're doing. Because when I was dealing with this one company, this high performance go kart mini bike company, there was no such thing as a Predator engine back then. No such no. thing. No, and Not I don't even know if I don't even know if Greyhound engines were out yet they might have been greyhound was the predecessor of predator uh and then greyhound engines you know they're a honda clone but i tell you what man those are some good engines we got one that's about almost 20 years old on a log splitter yep. and johnny best was going to buy a new engine until I told him, no, we're just going to redo that. And we're going to do a bottom overhaul on that engine and uh, do the car on it. And he was like, where are we going to get the gaskets? I said, don't worry about it. I'll get the gaskets. Yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah, ended yeah. up we ended up ordering two. And they wasn't the right millimeter. They sent me the wrong gaskets. So by the time they sent me the gaskets that I ordered for free, uh, we already made two gaskets yep. ourselves. Well, okay, we were in a hurry to we were in a hurry to get that log splitter up and running. Yep. Well, I know that right now they're actually uh, taking that Predator uh, two twelve and yeah, someone's actually uh, redoing them. And making them bigger, uh, and they're uh, uh, Tillotson engine, and they're coming out in blue. Yeah, yeah Tillotsons. I know about the Tillotsons engines uh, yep. now uh, because you know I'm, I'm very familiar with the Tillotsons carburetors. You know, yep. on the old, the old, old chainsaws, right? Right. And if and look, that's when men were a a man was a man back then. Men oh, were yeah. men back then. I'm talking yeah. about in the 50s and 60s. You had a four foot bar on your pooling chainsaw. Okay. And that sucker, and it was all magnesium or aluminum. The it frame and all that. Still heavy and shit, that's when <laughs> men were men. I'm talking mm -hmm. about arms this big around, you know? Yep. So, you know, I'm talking about hard working man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's all we have in the shop is a Tillotson uh, carburetor on that one. Yeah. And I've got parts for those Tillotson carburetors. I have parts you, for, for them. Yeah, those, those, those men that were carrying those saws came from the old days of the old uh, two man saws, you know. So a, a chainsaw was a step up for them. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Strong backs and strong arms. I was yep. going to say something and I forgot what it was. But anyway, I've got, oh, the old Max saws. We call them old Max, the big Max, big Max, the McCulloch, McCulloch saws. Okay. Uh, that's when Mr. McCulloch, at that time, he made a tourist attraction in Arizona called Lake Havasu. Havasu City, and um, yep. I was, I was frozen. Did y'all hear what I said? Yeah, yeah, well, we were. Oh, yeah. City. Okay, yeah. Mr. McCulloch himself, he 
he founded that town of Havasu. He founded it. Uh, if it wouldn't be for Mr. McCulloch, Havasu wouldn't be there, more than likely. He bought a lot of, he bought, I forget how many hundreds and hundreds of acres to start that town. And he moved the old London Bridge is falling down, falling yep. down. He moved the London Bridge from England over to Lake Havasu. Yep. Piece by piece. Yep. He stone by stone, numbered, all that good stuff. And they rebuilt it. He paid for that. Yep. And that was his gimmick. So anyway, and he invented the what, what we call the McCulloch chainsaw now. Yep. And also uh, saws to cut wood with, you know, like a circular saw. Yeah. And no reduction gear. That's the one that's going to kill you. All right, Cajun, it's almost 11.30 for me, so I need to get on out of here, and I got to get in there and get to bed, because like I said, you know, it's about yeah. seven hours from now. I'm going to be getting up, getting ready to be at work by 8 o'clock. It is almost uh, 11.30. All yeah. right, made it. All right, me and Brian yeah. will hang up here for a little while. I All got right. something I want to talk to him about anyway. All right. Well, Brian, it was nice meeting you. You too, Mater. All right. All right. Well, everybody else out there in chat, y'all have a good one, and I'll talk to y'all next time. All right. Blue time, mate. Love, peace, right. and cracking grease, brother. See you later. Peace out. All right. Oh. Alexander's been putting stuff up in the comment. Yeah, go sports, isn't it, Cajun? No, it was uh, go power sports or whatever I mentioned earlier. I, I wish I could find that old company I used to deal with. They used to sell the Morgay cart frames, mm -hmm. sprint carts, sprint carts, you know, which is a go kart. They call them sprint carts, not yeah. sprint cars, you know, like my buddy Jason Johnson died in. He's from over here in Eunice. Uh, he died uh, on the outlaw. Uh, he was in the outlaw circuit, the outlaw uh, sprint cars. And oh, hell, I forget how fast they would going through uh turn three or turn turn one or turn three and he went up yeah. into billboards and all that and then you know he died not long later you know wow. should have seen that funeral procession here in town and they wow. had a 18 wheeler uh trailer with his one of his cars on top of it yeah uh, you know his his car hauler and it was an 18 yeah. wheeler and they'd haul like two or three cars in that trailer. You know, it depends on what class he was running or whatever. Right. And yeah, that was a sad day for the town of Eunice, Louisiana. Mm. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alexander, if I could find that old company I used to deal with for my racing parts, for those, uh, sprint carts, uh, and it's not Go Power Sports. It's not them. I know that for a fact because they don't handle any pistons or racing cams or anything for Briggs and Stratton engines. And the Briggs and Stratton engines, unless uh, the Predators and the Tillerson has took over. But there's a lot of people that still run the five horse Briggs and Stratton. Right. You know, and it was the 13, uh, the 13, five, uh, I forgot, but it was the, it was the blocks with the roller bearing in them, uh -huh. not the aluminum bushing bearing. You know what I'm talking about? Right. Oh, for right. the crank. And I mean, and I have one of those engines, uh, I think there's a broken rod in it, if I'm not mistaken. There's a broken rod in it. Something turned loose in it. So right. I still didn't take it apart yet. Uh, but it's one with the roller bearings in it. It's got the little pop-out off of the sump cover. Right. It's got the little pop-out where the bearing sits in. So you can change the bearing without to strip the whole motor apart or something? No. Uh -uh. No, no, no. No, 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 yeah, no, no, you have to take it out from the inside. 
Uh, okay. I mean, the, the hole's there, you know, but yeah. you have to, uh, you know, then you seal. I mean, I haven't even took the seal. I, I haven't done nothing to it yet. But no, you. I think you on those you have to pop the baron out from the in, inside of the sump cover. Uh, okay. On those. What's up, Crystal and Sky? That's Mater's wife. Ah, uh, okay, cool, cool. <clears throat> oh, man. Oh, Doug Sweeney was another one. Yeah, I know Doug. I know Doug. Don't you know Doug, uh, Brian? I don't know. He was friends with uh, Stacy. Twisted R Racing. I might know him. Do you remember we used to go on TLT's channel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, uh, you remember Twisted R Racing, Stacy? Yeah. Okay. Well, Stacy, me, Doug Sweeney. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a... Uh, uh, this guy down in Florida, was it Tampa Bay Customs or something? Uh, he builds racing engines. Uh, you know, for you know, small engines. He's got. Uh, he was up there with us earlier with Pul Pulla Bear Ed. Anyway, uh, Stacy is no longer on YouTube. That's what I was saying earlier. But I remember Doug Alexander. I remember Doug, and now I'm going back quite a you know a few years too. You know, because I was uh, like, I was part of Small Engine Nation with uh, Craig Durbin. Remember him, Craig Brian? Too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Craig and Diane yeah, Durbin. Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, wait a minute. Hold on. What's Joe Durbin's no. wife's name? Kathy, Diane. right? Diane. That's Joe oh, Durbin. Diane. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. No, no, no. All right. All right. Kathy, then, uh, Kathy, Durbin. Kathy Durbin was Craig's wife. Craig and Kathy. Yeah. 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 That's what I wanted to make sure of before I spit out some stuff. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen Kathy or Craig in a while either. Yeah. I haven't seen them in a while neither. Uh, I think. Oh, let me see. It was before I went to the hospital for a month. Uh, Craig, or right after I seen Craig and he. Wish me well, it must have been after I got out. So Doug 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 hadn't been keeping too well lately. Okay. Oh, Brian. Remember yeah. we were talking about my Jeep? Yeah. With that problem like that? Uh, -huh. uh I think I had told you I uh, took the top of the relay off, the cap, okay. the plastic cap of the relay off, and yeah. I could turn the engine over. You know, I could press it with my fingers, right. the relay. Right. Yeah, just close the relay. Yeah. And I could press it, the engine would turn over a couple of times, and then I can get in and start it. No problem. Right. The engine would start right up. No problem. Then that kind of you know, angle down. It wouldn't do it every time. Right. So, uh, I ordered the, not the, not the key tumbler itself, but in between the key tumbler and the flat, it's a square box like that. Yeah. That's, your actual, that's your actual switch, you know? Right. And I ordered that and the uh, actuator pin that goes okay. in between the switch and the key tumble. Yeah, it looks like or a little flag. Of those. Huh? It looks like a little flag. Uh, no, it's the actuator oh. pins are like curved like that. And then oh. they go, then those go into that ignition switch box itself, you know. Okay. And then when you turn it, well, I thought one of the, the one side of the actuator pin had broke off, but it was not that. It was not that. Mm. So, me and Johnny, we were doing something with the Jeep one day, and he said, uh, wait, he was doing this with the relay. Right. And then I 
do this. And when I'd let it off, like, you know, I was keeping on like, neat, 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 neat with the key. Yeah. I'd, I'd keep hitting it. And then sometimes it would want to start. I'm like, Johnny Best said, hey, try this. Put, put your key forward, push it all the way forward, and then back off a skull ship, like a thousandth of an inch, you know? Right. And guess what? I could turn the key and then back it off a hair, and it would start. Hmm. I'm like, oh, I know what it is now. I know what it is now. Nice. Nice. It was the it, the actual little square <laughs> white box. The contacts in it were dirty. Okay. So already had the parts in stock. Uh, you know, like I said, I ordered that and the actuator pin part. Mm hmm And he was like, well, just can't you just clean that? You know, the contacts in it says, no, you can't take, can't, it, it doesn't no, unscrew. It together. Doesn't unscrew. It's molded, whatever. Well, guess what? When I took it out, I put the new one in, boom, right off the bat, no problem. Nice. When I got everything back together, I looked at the ignition switch. Sure right. enough, there were four screws in it where you could take it apart, and clean the contacts. But you didn't do that, did you? No, I put the brand new one on. Oh, okay, good. Never had a problem with it since. Nice. Nice, good deal. Oh, man. I mean, I was beating my head. And I know, I know electronics, you know. But I was... I knew it was somewhere in between. I thought it was in between the ignition switch and the relay box. But yeah. it wasn't. It was the actual ignition switch. The actual ignition switch. Good. Man. Right. Sure beats your place in the valve body. Yeah, all that. Uh, well, not the valve body. That uh, uh, neutral safety switch. Which on is the in the valve body. Yeah. Oh, it is in the valve body? Yeah, part of the valve body. Oh, yeah. I thought I thought the contact switch was on the outside of the transmission. No, that's a reverse light switch. Oh, okay, man. Yeah, Dodge has been doing that for years. For for back in the back in the sixties and seventies, the neutral safety switch was on the outside, um, along with the reverse light switch. And then, sometime in the nineties, they started integrating it into the uh, valve body. Oh boy! Which was stupid, but they did, and basically created a fiasco where you had to buy a two, three, four, five hundred dollar valve body, depending on you know the year and all that stuff. Oh, you had to buy the valve body. You just uh... yep. Oh, you, you buy man. a rebuilt. You bought. You just buy a rebuilt valve body and slap it in there, and which yeah, slap but... it in there makes it sound easy, but it's not. I mean, you right, got to drop right. it in. The fluid, the filter, yeah. unhook the harness, and then you gotta you gotta replace a valve body and run the harness through the case. And if you don't get the uh, seal right in the case, it leaks, and uh, it's a mess. It's a freaking mess. So thank God it was the ignition switch. It's a bunch of bull butter. Put it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now, to change the valve body, you don't have to take the transmission out of the vehicle, do you? No, no, no. You That's just what drop, I saw it, yeah. Yeah, you drop yeah. the pan and the filter, disconnect yeah, the, uh, disconnect the uh, lever on the outside, disconnect the uh, harness connection. <coughs> yeah, Push you got a... Uh, drop it out. You got a bunch of stainless steel bolts holding it up mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. Yeah, probably between uh, 12 and 17 of them. I can't remember exactly how many on that transmission. Yeah. I had a, a 63 Chevy with a two-speed power glide in it. Yeah. And uh, in the transmission, the spool valve, don't ask me how that got bent. I have no idea. But there's uh -huh. a little sp spool valve about yeah. that long, 
and it's got all little spools on it, you know? Right, right. Well, and, it, and, it, and it related to the, uh, there should have been a lever that was a that was on the outside that would actuate that spool about depending on what gear yeah. you were in. Yeah, yeah, to turn it, yeah, park, reverse, or, you know, low drive, because they had low yeah. end drive on a two-speed, and yeah. neutral, yeah, it would move back and forth like that. And I put it in, a new one in, that I got from a junkyard. Uh -huh. uh, I had to bend it just a hair to get it in. I had to finagle right. it. And yeah. I had to kind of force bend it a little bit, and then, boom. But I never had no problems with the transmission after that. But I don't know what caused that spool valve to go out like that. No yeah, idea. Mine. My Jetta's got a, I got to replace the valve body in my Jetta because the transmission's starting to slip uh, between uh, second and third. And the only reason I haven't replaced it yet is because it's a $700 valve body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel, I feel it. I feel it in my pocket, but for you. If I had the money and the time, I would just pull it out, convert it to manual transmission and shift gears, but. I mean, it I costs, love, it costs about it. to do that, but. I love a manual transmission. I do. Oh, I do. If I hadn't bought the Jetta for 800 bucks, I'd wish I'd had a manual, but I mean, I paid 800 bucks for the darn thing, so. Oh, okay. Well, you don't have a lot invested in the vehicle. Right, so. right. Yeah. That's why I, I told you to spend $700 on a valve body, so I've just been driving it with a little slip. I don't care. Yeah, is that uh, what they call that in the back of the transmission on them autos? Uh, sprag gears. I think so. Yeah, sprag gears, and uh, I think they're in the back of the transmission. I had a transmission one time that sprag gears were uh, gone or whatever, and uh -huh. my cousin, uh, he was a little buff. He was in Baton Rouge, and I was living that far from Baton Rouge, like uh, twenty miles to the center of town. Yeah, and I, I was in a little small town, but uh, I got the truck over there, and yeah. he charged me uh, three hundred for the whole job. Nice. Yeah, right. yeah. I think he had to. I think he said he just put a new tranny or a new tail piece where the sprag gears went. I don't know exactly where the sprag gears are. I know that it's round. Right. Yeah, usually the sprag gears, you got to take the uh, front pump out. Everything everything falls out the front of the transmission after it's out of the car. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, the converter he got me, out and you he got me all the good for 300 bucks. Wow, that's good. Yeah, now look, now this is... Uh, 19... 25 years ago, I'm going to just say. I want to mm -hmm. say it was 1996 or seven, something yeah. like that. So that would be about 25 years ago. Yeah. Bama mowers might possibly pop up. Well, send him an email, Alexander. Bama mowers, let me see if I got Bama. I doubt if I got Bama in my uh, address book. Nope, I don't. Send him an email, Alexander. Uh, let's see here. All right, keep the uh, crowd uh, entertained, Brian. Right. Right. Uh, I'll be right back. I gotta go lean off the dock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mm. 
Yeah, Craig, I haven't, or yeah, yeah, Alexander, I haven't talked to Craig in a while. Excuse me, but I haven't been in, it, in too many chats lately either. Alexander, how's your uh, how's your coin sales been doing? Uh, Mama gave you a treat. Uh, Mama gave you a treat. See my little puppy, puppy dog. Uh, yeah, Mama gave him a treat. Yeah. Alexander said uh, he might possibly pop up. I sent Dan a, a share, but he might be sleeping. He might be. Did you hear what we was talking about earlier, Brian, on those Kawasaki water cool engines? Um, I don't remember. I'm sure, in later, I'm sure in later years they became a water cool engine. Oh, I thought Most you might have heard. Oh, yeah. No, I'm talking about uh, the, like for zero turn. Oh, no. I don't know anything about that. Zero turn mower. Oh, okay. I thought you might have heard us. I don't know if you were in here when we were talking about the camshaft on that particular engine, mm -hmm. on the water cool engines. But they made out of plastic. Oh, and really? Actually, it was like a safety for the engine. It was, uh, you know, not just regular old plastic, you know, would they make a outside of a fan with or a fan grill, you know, that strong plastic or like a nylon type plastic. Yeah. Uh, that's a, like a safety point or something. If you're, if your uh, cooling system has a hiccup in it, right. like when you uh, say, you, say you're taking a sip of your beer or whatever, or Coke, and you get an air bubble caught, and it hurts going down until it gets to your stomach. Yeah. Well, uh, air bubble, something like that, and that air bubble probably won't go away uh, on that engine. Uh, and if the engine overheats, the cam... Uh, gear is going to give away. Hmm. And it saves your engine. But when you order the replacement cam, you get a metal gear. Interesting. I didn't know that about I the know, uh, sockets. I know on the uh, Ford uh, modular engines, the 5.4s, the 4.6, they're lobes. Are pressed on to the camshaft. I ran into that problem. I had a uh, customer bring his vehicle in and he was having problems with his engine and he had just had an overheating problem resolved in another shop, but they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And uh, I, I went through that motor or I went through diagnosis on that thing for probably two or three weeks. And then I started getting into uh, camshaft timing and stuff like that. And I ended up measuring out the timing on the lobes and they were off. Yeah. Okay. Either they turned, one of them turned, or it was wore down. No, they slipped. Yeah, they turned. Yeah, they turned. Like, so on, the, a, like on the Briggs yeah. and Stratton cam gears, the plastic gears. Yeah. They, uh, they are epoxy to the right. camshaft. The gear itself, like that, and then you have your camshaft going in. Like mm -hmm. the old style metal ones, the camshaft has a spline on it. Right. Like uh, when you stab a transmission, you know, yeah. through an engine. And then your metal cam gear has, has you know, female splines, you know, the grooves. Yeah. And uh, the plastic ones are epoxy. Hmm. 
Hmm. And that will throw quite a few technicians off after every. But you see, the customer didn't tell them that they hit something real hard, you know. Right, right. Or the technician just doesn't know about the plastic ear being uh, epoxied on that. I ran, I ran across quite a few of them uh, in my shop, you know. So I would just change the camshaft out from a donor engine. Yeah, we uh, we bought some. Uh... <coughs> We bought some aftermarket cams that were solid cams. You know, they didn't have, the, they weren't uh, pressed together. Right, and right. You know, probably a probably cam, maybe. probably a cam too that has just a little bit more oomph to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the uh, the duration and lift. Yeah, I didn't know anything about all that. The yeah. uh, uh, service writer found them online and so they were about $150 a piece cheaper than buying them from Ford so you know the customer right. was happy about that because he already spent all, a bunch of money on the cooling system and all this other stuff but now he was a couple hundred dollars in the diagnosis on it and so right. we replaced the cams and that solved the problem fixed it right up <clears throat> I like Johnny Best. He put his truck in the shop. Me and him was trying to diagnose before he changed the uh, the plenum and all that on his uh, yeah. 350, 350 Vortec engine. We yeah. diagnosed it down to, uh, well, we found three three air leaks Yeah. on top of the intake. And, you know, all, all that's plastic. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> on a 350 vortex. It's plastic. Well, not plastic, plastic, but anyway. No, it's, it's, it's composite, but it's still plastic. Yeah. I mean, the type yeah. of plastic. Yeah. I know what yeah. you're talking about. Vortex engines. So we found three air leak. Uh, we changed the parts for those. And it was still running bad. And yeah. uh, Larry. From Larry's Tire Mechanic Shop up the road, told mm -hmm. me I had called him. I says because Johnny didn't quite get what he was talking about. I guess I don't know. Uh, it was sprinkling, drizzling, and I went to pick Johnny up uh, to yeah. get his truck because the guy was going to charge him, I think, three hundred to fix the problem. Yeah, and. So I was picking him up, and the guy lifts the hood and shows him where it was at. Right. So I went to Larry about a week later, you know, after we found those intake leaks. Uh, and I asked Larry, I said, he says, you have to take the intake off, you know, the plenum off. Anyway, right. so Johnny Best orders the kit, I think it was uh, 80, 80 something bucks. Right. To plant them in the gaskets and stuff for that Vortex. Well, when he put that O ring on, or that, but well, it's a like a thick O ring, a square O ring. Right. Uh, well, the valve body, that spider gear valve body goes on. Yeah, spider gear, yeah. or spider, spider uh, the fuel injectors. Yeah, not a spider gear. Yeah, a spider no, or, a, no, or yeah. a crab, or we, we yeah. call it a crab over here. But they call it, in the business they call it spider. It's yeah, a, correct. It's a, fuel, it's a fuel injectors. Right, right, the fuel injectors. So, but we took that off, and we found two of them that were completely stopped up. So yeah. Johnny found two of them from another donor. Uh. Oh, yeah, another donor deal, and change those out, put it on, and it, it's, it still ran rough. Yeah. And then he changed some. He unplugged one of the sensors. I think it was off from where the air, that big air body goes from that big round filter. Yeah, the, air, the, the mass airflow sensor. Yeah, I, uh, he unplugged one of those sensors. Mm -hmm. It ran good, but it idled high. High, right. I mean, very high. 
Yeah, probably like 2,500 RPM, give or take some. I think something like that, yeah, because he does have attack in his truck. Uh, well, he finally brought it to a shop. And I think three days later, $200 lighter out of his pocket, uh, he didn't put the, the O-ring right in. Oh, shit. Yeah, for the for that valve body, that, uh, that, that spider. Oh, the spider, yeah. Or whatever, you know, where it goes in on top of the planter. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if they had to take the plantum off to straighten it out, or they just huh. did it like yeah. that. But it, it took them a while. Yeah, so they did have you, to, always got, you always got to take the damn upper plantum off those things to do anything to them. Okay. Uh, but it was right there where that valve body sat down at. Yeah. It was... One side of it was low, and that's where it was yeah, sucking air from. Yeah, I used to always get problems with those things coming in every time, and it was usually the uh, it was usually the uh, either the fuel pressure regulator would be leaking fuel, or uh, the injectors would start to fail. Yeah, well, he did have two of them that were bad, and it. Uh, he brought his truck to Jamie T to Tiger Auto Sales up yeah. in Mamu, and the mechanic said, "Look, I'm gonna get you going smooth as silk. You know, I found the engine for you." Well, that's the engine that was giving him the problems. Okay, yeah. the engine was supposed to have seventy thousand miles on it, and I don't think that engine had seventy thousand miles. I think it had like uh two hundred and seventy thousand. Well no, not that much. Probably a hundred and seventy. Yeah. But then Alexander said the EGR valve. Yeah, well the uh, EGR valve was good, but where the EGR valve hose went to, it was taped together with black tape. So where it hit the uh intake. Usually, Alexander, the EGR valves are bad on the S10 Blazers, and the S10 pickup trucks with the W, uh, the VIN W uh, Vortec engine. They would get clogged up. The passages in the intake would build up a carbon, and the carbon would go into the EGR valve and hold the EGR valve open. Those were yeah. such a, those were such a nightmare. Uh, I remember the three old the old three old fives had a nightmare or something like that it was build up on the bottom of the intake the yeah. old i'm talking about in the uh 80s you know when the 305s yeah, came the out w, the vin w came out in about 88 89 and went up to about 96 when they changed out and went to a different design <clears throat> which was the 4.3 v6s we used to always have to pull the intakes off of those soak them go in there with a coat hanger and just scrape all the carbon off and everything else. And because yeah. if you just took the EGR valve out, clean the carbon, put the EGR valve back within a couple of days, it would come back with another chunk of the EGR valve. Yeah. And they would idle all jacked up and everything else. It was a nightmare. So we, we finally got, uh, we, we changed that EGR valve, uh, hose. Cause I think Johnny put a new EGR valve cause I told him about it. A buddy of mine had a 305 Vortec. I think it was a Vortec or it was a TBI, one of the two. And let's see, when did the uh, Vortec came out? 96, huh? No, the Vortec came out in like uh, 88 or 89. And it was on the huh? 4.3. 88 or 89. It was on the 4.3 V6. Um Oh, the that, six. Was, that was the first Vortec was the 4.3 V6. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, the 4.3, other than the Spider and the EGR valve problems, the 4.3 is an awesome motor. Now, a buddy of mine's got a whole engine at his shop down the road from uh, Blake's uh, Automotive. Yeah, R I was going to put a 4.3 in my Jeep. I had an 86 Jeep Cherokee with the V6 with the uh, 2 point. Uh, Six 2. or 2.8. No, it was a 2.6 or 2.8 V6. It was when Jeep went oh. to a GM motor, but it had that, uh, it had a big problem with the, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, damn, uh, 
uh, uh, emissions. Uh, it had a uh, uh, damn uh, mixture control solenoid on it. And the computers and the mixture control solenoids on those carbs were always problems. Okay. Because I know my truck, I think, okay, the 305s and the 350s, I think it was 96 when they came out with the Vortec on those, huh? 95. 95. 95? 95. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I had a 94, uh, I had a 94 K1500 and it had the 350, but it was, uh, it was a, uh, uh, throttle TBI. body at that time. Right. Yeah. TBI. TBI. Yeah. yeah. I had a 97 Silverado. What was that? 96. Yeah, that was, that was and Vortex. I had the 305 Vortec. Yeah. Yeah. And a buddy of mine was, like, oh no, no, they didn't make them until '97 or '98 or something like that. No, I said, no, "Boo, no. butter!" I said, "Boo, yeah. butter!" You want to see the title on my truck? Because I had it. You want to see the title on it? It's a safe bet. Did. When it went from the when it had the square dash, it was a TBI. If it had the round dash, it was a Vortec. Oh yeah, no, I had yeah, I had the round one and all that looked like yeah. uh, kind of like a. Uh, Real smooth and sleek looking yeah. dash. Yeah, yeah. kind of like a uh, intrepid dash, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. And but anyway, uh damn I got off track and I forgot what I was talking about. Uh, couldn't have been a VTEC. A VTEC is a Honda. It had to be a Vortec. Andrew. VTEC is Honda. I think he shortened VTEC oh. from Vortec. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 92 S10 Eddie Bauer, 4.3 VTEC. Oh, he meant Vortec. Eddie, Eddie Bauer is uh, Ford Explorers. Oh, okay. 4.3. Oh, yeah, I see where it, uh, S10 a 92. But they didn't have the Vortec in 92, did they? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, they had the Vortec starting in 88 or 89. Oh, that's right. You said that they, earlier. Yeah, yeah, they started with the, with with the half turn. Anything, anything that had a V6 um, could either be a Ven, a Ven W, which was a Vortec, or a Ven Z, which is the TBI. Okay, yeah. I remember a buddy of mine, James Graves, when I had my radio shop in Grosset, mm -hmm. uh, he had a 90 something with a V6 and it was that Vortec. You talk about that little truck with boot scoot boogie. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of them S10, you know, the, the midsize truck. Small truck, midsize, whatever. But he had that V6 uh, Vortec. Oh, play, man. I'll play that the, one, the one to have in those years, Andrew. Uh, was the uh bravado the Oldsmobile bravado? Those were styling, and they had the they had the Vortec engine in them. I always wanted one of those uh, Oldsmobile bravados. It was basically a S10 Blazer with a Oldsmobile, but it had leather seats. It had power, everything. It was a those were nice vehicles back in the day. Yeah, you see, my Jeep has a three point seven in it. V6. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a front wheel drive neither. Naturally, it's not a front wheel drive. It's a Liberty, uh -huh. isn't it? Yeah. Liberty. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I got, uh, I think, three or four four wheel drives on that thing. Yeah. I know they use that V6. They started using that V6 and everything. Even the Wranglers have that V6. Oh, okay. So that, all right. That, I think somebody else reminded me of that. That V6 is not a Mopar engine, is it? I don't remember. No, I think the, the diesel, the diesel isn't Mopar. Okay. Yeah, because the they V6 got a girl. Mopar, but there's a there's a diesel that they used in some of those liberties, especially up in Canada. Um, I think it's a uh oh my god, who's it made by? I gotta look it up now. I know the ones you're talking about with the diesels because uh, I was watching this one video where this guy had a V. Uh, I want to say it was a V6 diesel. Uh, 
but he had the same problem with his uh, ignition switch. It, that's the one where I learned uh, about the uh, relay. But Princess Jane. Oh, uh, it's an Italian, or it's made in Italy by VM Motori, which is owned by Detroit Diesel. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a girl that she's a mechanic. Uh, uh, she's in the military, retired from the military, but she is still contracted to the military of stuff. But her name's Princess Jamie on YouTube. And yeah. girl knows her stuff. <laughs> uh, she's got a, I think it's a 350 in her kitchen that her grandpa helped her overhaul years and years ago. And yeah. I think all she needs is uh, the distributor on it and a battery and that's the only thing keeping it from firing up. But I think she was the one that said uh, something about the Liberties, the V6s, the 3.7s, are not actually an AMC motor, you know, or Mopar. It's uh, something else. Like, like what she was saying just now. Not the diesel one, the gas engine. Uh, and then I have the Liberty uh, Limited Edition also. That's just for the leather seats and the heated seats and, you know, all that good stuff. Hmm. No, everything I'm looking up, they say it's made by Chrysler. They used it in the uh, <coughs> Magnums. And... Yeah, that B6, that 3.7 B6, I know it got a lot of use. Yeah, I had a Dodge truck, my old green Dodge. I want to say it was a B6 in that thing. Got You're what it back. was in there. I'll All be right back. I'm thinking of hanging off the dock. All right. <laughs> Cajun style. Boudreaux style. I had access to Hollanders seven, several times a day. Now, there you go. That thing about the 4.3 was hit and missed. Some were defected. Some were not. As long as you cared for it. It would last forever. That's like any engine, you know, but if you got electronic problems, well, take a guess. Take a guess. <laughs> you got some of them lemons like that, that the wiring harnesses and all that or whatever was, uh, they were just lemons. Uh, it was actually in the computer parts of it. And then now your Honda Accords, uh, if anybody has a Honda Accord, well, uh, if your transmission is acting up, wanting to jump from drive to second to low, and your speedometer don't work, your speedometer and your odometer don't work, uh, it's a, a resonator. It's a one, one mega ohm resonator. That's built in on the dashboard cluster behind the gauges. You change that, it's a uh, dollar fifty part, dollar buck buck fifty part, and you're good to go. So you can take out the uh, cluster dial cl uh, dash cluster with the speedometer and all that, and you bring it to an electronic shop, 
with the part if yeah. you don't have any soldering skills and that resonator is the problems on those honda accords oh i remember that durango andrew i remember you and me talking about that thing a while ago that thing was a, like a ghost couldn't figure out what was going on well then you know it's always hard for me because i'm a hands-on guy so it's hard for me to talk people through problems with the cars i'm i'm a I'm a hands-on guy. I got to have my hands on the problem, you know? Right. Yeah. You got to see what it's doing actually. Right. Know? Yeah. Just like when I was, me and uh, five other buddies of mine, we were on this small engine form. Right. And the uh, Briggs and Stratton section. People would come in and uh, say, hey, my, uh, my lawnmower's not doing this, you know, or my tiller's not doing this. <coughs> and sometimes they would put the horsepower of the engine in there or the foot pound torque effect, if yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, because Briggs and Stratton doesn't do horsepower anymore, they do foot pounds mm -hmm. of torque. And if you go by, like, say, a 6.5, well, that's not a six and a half horsepower engine. Right. You know, it might be a four and a half, you know. It just depends on what it's labeled at. Anyway, because you, you can see that when you look at the model number, mm -hmm. uh, if you see 12 on there or 13, well, that's only 12 cubic inches, you know. Yeah. And then your 13s, your 13 cubic inches were your five horse engines, like on a go kart or a mini bike. Right. So, anyway, uh, the uh, what I was talking about earlier, Brian, was the Honda Accords. Yeah. Uh, they had a, I don't know if they had a recall on them, but Honda knows about it. It's, uh, your transmission would act funny. Wouldn't right. shift or shift to first while you're doing 30 miles an hour or 35. It would shift down to first and your speedometer right. wouldn't work on yeah. the gauge. And your odometer wouldn't work. Well, they got a little one meg resonator in there. It's a little part about that big. Right. And if you're good at soldering, well, you can change the part out yourself or bring it to an electronic shop computer repair shop, whatever, let them do it, pay them 30 or 40 bucks, you know, which is well worth it, you know, yeah. cause they, they've been soldering every day of their lives almost. And instead of you burning the traces off of that circuit board, yeah. you reinstall it and boom, your car is good to go. Yeah. We had a, uh, I had a uh, speedo shop that would do all that. You know, if I, ran into an issue with a speedo or something that had to be done i would just send it up to troy and he would fix it all up and shit make it like new again okay troy and names found sounds familiar yeah he's here in san diego he used to uh he used to work at san diego speedo tack and when they closed he uh, moved out to uh Santee and opened up his own place, San Diego Speedometer. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he did all my, he uh, rebuilt the, uh, I bought a cluster for my 75 Chevy, but the, cl uh, the cluster had a tack in it, which I wanted. So he rebuilt and he re restored the whole cluster and uh, set up the tack so I could run it off the distributor. Because originally in those years, you had to have a special harness that came off the alternator to run the tack. And so oh, he, changed, okay. he, he, he changed the tack. So all I had to do was run a single wire from uh, from the harness to the distributor and run the tack. Mm. Okay. He charged me 180 bucks, and that, that freaking cluster looked like it left the show on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he painted the arms, the original orange, highlighted all the numbers so they looked original, made sure the uh, 
made sure the fuel gauge and the other gauges in the uh, small pods work correctly. I mean, he decked that thing out. Oh, that works. So he uh, uh, did the, the, I say the plastic or glass. That all was nice and clean and clear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The crystal, yeah. I call yeah. it the crystal, but the... Uh, Right, yeah, crystal, cool like on a watch, like on a watch, yeah. you call that glass part a crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, he made that all look like transparent, like you couldn't tell it was, you couldn't tell it was 40 years old when he got yeah. done. Unless you put your fingerprint on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, touch it and you can see your fingerprints on it. Yeah. Andrew said, I I fixed a melted throttle cable line with a big pin and duct tape on an emergency run. That worked. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember the Yugos, Andrew. You remember the what? Citroen? I actually, when I was working at Chevron in Mission Valley, uh, back when the street was still called Stadium Way before they changed everything to Qualcomm Way, um, I used to have a customer, an old customer, come up with a Citroen, which is a European front-wheel drive car. It was a very interesting car and very dependable. The car had to have been, at that time, that was, you know, that was back in the 90s. That car had, that car had to have been 30 years old, and he had it imported here from Europe uh, when he came over. I remember the Yugos. That's a uh, double syllable, uh, double two syllable word for you go, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember the old, uh, I remember the old 600 Hondas when they had the uh, air cooled motors in them when Honda first came out. You're talking about the motorcycle? Well, no, no, the car. Oh, okay. The Honda 600. And they were air-cooled? Yeah. No radiator? Yeah, for, like for sure, Andrew. No radiator? Nope. Like a, like a Volkswagen? Yeah, but the engine oh, was wait in a minute. front. The engine was in wait front. A minute. A little hatchback Honda. There was a guy in between Abbeville and Kaplan. He mm -hmm. was an airline pilot. He worked for some big company, whatever. He did crop dusting work too and all that. But his trade was uh, he was an aviation technician and a pilot and a pilot. And he hoarded. He probably loved the sob. He hoarded these Volkswagen Beetle Bug. You know, the bug, Volkswagen Bug, with the engine in the trunk. Yeah. The vans, the little micro buses, little Volkswagen uh, vans. Uh, and he had. Yeah. Oh God, three or four thousand, if not more, of the Volkswagen. And everybody would knock on his door and say, Hey, uh, I need a part for this. He says, I'm sorry, I'm not a junkyard. These are my cars. These are my cars. He says, I will be fixing them up one day. And he knew something was going to go awry. You know, something, yeah. something, the chick was going to hit the fan. Okay. He knew it. And every now and then you seen two or three of them for sale in his front yard. That's what he was doing with it. Yeah. He was fixing them up uh, and, and a warranty on them. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, let's see, he passed away. But the Abbeville Meridional, 
newspaper, Abbeville Meridno, did a story on it before he died. Yeah. And they showed how many cars he had behind his house on 10 acres. He had full 10 acres, and a lot of the cars were on top of each other. Oh, shit. Stacked on top. Okay. Yeah. But he did it in a way that the cars wouldn't get hurt. Okay. Like huh. the weight pressing down and all that. Right. He had a right. certain way to do it to stack these cars where he wasn't. Now, if he had an old junker that was already stripped out, he would put a good car on top of that one. You know, but he yeah. had them like eight high. <laughs> I remember, I remember at any given time, I would have four or five Volkswagens parked on my street that I would pick up. Now, mind you, this was back in the 80s and 90s. I could pick these things up for 50 or 100 bucks. Yeah. You know? Oh, okay. And I'd have them towed here, and I'd re, you know, I had this whole thing going on where I was rebuilding air cooled motors and I was fixing the electrical, and I would sell these things off for five or 600 bucks a piece, you know? Yeah. And right now, what you could get for a, a Volkswagen oh, bug, a couple, of three, four thousand, five thousand. Yeah, yeah. You know, something that's restored completely, like showroom condition. Hello. Yeah, mine weren't that good. I made I made sure that the brake system was good, the engine was good, the trans axle right. was good, and the electrical right. was good. They could yeah, get that like, car started up and drive away and know that their lights right. and their brakes and all that stuff worked. The right. paint, yeah. Was, you know, I was I was no body shop, so I didn't do paint. The closest thing I got to body work is I had a '59 rag top that I replaced the rag top on. Um, and I sold that one for 900 bucks. I think it was. Yeah. I remember the Geo Metro. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The I three was, cylinders. I always wanted a Geo yeah. Metro, but never had one. Uh, my buddy's wife had one and yeah. my neighbor, she, she traded it in, which she was telling us that, uh, Uh, she was in the market for a new car, you know, and she bought brand new. She didn't buy you. She bought brand new. And mm. all of a sudden, I see her new car at her house. Yeah. And um, and then uh, my neighbor, uh, I lived across the street from my buddy and his wife. And uh, my buddy next door to me, uh, he had three acres next to my three acres. And he was like, uh, man, I'm looking for a car. You know, my my car is on its last leg. Uh, like actually, he said it's gonna take a shit in about a week. You know, so I get with Patsy, the the lady that had the Geo Metro with that little three cylinder in, it. Mm -hmm. and I said, "What did you do with your Geo?" She said, I traded it in. I said, how much they gave it? For, how much they gave you for it? She said, I think 200 bucks or something. That's look, that lady did a maintenance on that car. Like it was supposed to be maintained by the Chevy dealership. Right. Right there in town. And I says, well, Brad, my neighbor, Brad Reinhardt needs a car. His took a dump or fixing to she says let me go see if they're gonna give me the car back no they did not they already went through it washed it vacuumed it did the oil change uh or whatever point inspection on it and it was already on the lot for two thousand dollars wow and they only gave her 150 bucks for it she was mad yeah he was going to give it to my, her neighbor, which was my neighbor, but my neighbor on my side of the road, you know? Right. Yeah. She was going to give it to that family. You know, he had uh, three kids, three daughters, no sons, three daughters. She was going to give it to him. Yeah. And she offered him 500, you know, 
for their for their work that they did on the car. Right. You know, all change and all that. She says, I'll give you 500 for it because I'm going to give the car away. They says, nope, a deal's a deal. She said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll never deal with y'all again, and I might return the brand new car I bought. Right. They still didn't budge. She was mad. Oh, yeah, I don't doubt it. Give her $150 for her car and a trade in, and they're going to sell it for $2,000, $2,500? Yeah. She was yeah, I usually, I usually tell people, unless, unless you owe money on the car and you're just going to roll the loan over, sell it sell, sell it yourself. You're yeah. More it. Yep. But. I mean, unless there's something catastrophically wrong with the car. Then hell, yeah. you know, screw the deal. No, screw because the deal over, you know, I've had a lot of people that'll pick their broken cars up. You know, they'll tell us just put it together enough so I can drive it to the dealership. And the dealership usually all they look at is the mileage on the car and 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 the outside of it. And they make right. you an offer. I've never had a dealership drive a car unless you go to one of those private little dealerships. Then at that point, they you know they want they want to get the best car they can so they can put it on their lot. But right. big car dealerships, you know, if they find that it's not worth fixing, they'll just send it to auction and sell it off at auction. Yeah. Right. What are you doing? Well Kevin? guys, let me see. It's uh twelve thirty almost. Yeah. My time. I think it's about what, uh nine thirty your time? Ten thirty. Ten thirty. Oh, yeah. two hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're on the same time zone as Arizona. So, yeah. All right, all guys. Right, uh, I appreciate yeah. you coming up, Brian. Yep. You all have and a good night. We'll talk we'll, to you later. Me and Mater is going to start doing uh, some more uh, once or twice a week live streams That's like fine. this. Sounds good. I'll look out for it. And what we're going to be doing is. Uh, Talking small engines and maybe Steve's small engine uh, okay. up in Canada. He's on mm -hmm. your time. He's up mm -hmm. on the island up there to the west up of Canada. Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver. Yeah. He's on the island over there. He uh, he owns a shop, small engine shop. Cool. So I figured he might have showed up tonight, you know, but he probably didn't. Uh, he, I don't think he checks his emails in the afternoons. In the evening, yeah. So me, I, so came on, I came on around uh, what eight thirty or nine thirty or something. <laughs> so yeah, more like seven thirty my time. Yeah, so, you're down, you can drive for three hours. So yeah, yeah. Send me a send me a link in the email. If I see it, I'll pop on. Yeah, I'm gonna start doing it from this uh, this YouTube channel here. Okay, sounds good. And we'll talk uh, shop tools, you know, if you got, you know, tools to show off, a specialty tool or whatever. Uh, All right. And we usually talk engines. Uh, um, I'm going to get a couple of other guys up here that, that know about car, car engines, you know, yeah. and all that. So. Sounds all right, good. I appreciate you, all buddy. Right, Y'all have a good night. All right. And as always, love. Peace and crackling grease. Catch y'all. Blue tie.